The Royal Commission is now in session. Good morning, uh, everybody. Welcome to the third day of this, the 32nd uh, public hearing of the Royal Commission, uh, revisiting uh, service providers. We commence uh, with uh, an acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge the Jagera people and the Turbal people as the traditional, traditional custodians of Mianjin, Brisbane, the land on which we are gathered for this hearing, and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We also uh, acknowledge First Nations people who are participating in this hearing, including those who are following the hearing either in person or via the live stream. Um, Ms. E. Smith, if it's uh, all right with you, I propose uh, to put to Mr. Duggan, who I understand is here, uh, a certain proposition arising, at least one proposition, arising out of the uh, evidence yesterday and uh, the report uh, that was referred to in some detail uh, on uh, uh, Sunnyfield. Uh, Mr. Duggan, where are you? Oh, there you are. Yes, Chair. As you'll appreciate, the findings in the Commissioner's report on Public Hearing 13 have a significance for Sunnyfield going well beyond the violence and abuse experienced by <coughs> Melissa Carl and Chen and the entirely inappropriate treatment according, accorded to Eliza and other family members. Uh, that is recounted in the uh, report and, of course, uh, I don't uh, underestimate the significance of that. Uh, I appreciate that, uh, according to the evidence given by Mr Highland, a written apology has been made to the residents and families, and that the chair of Sunnyfield uh, has met with the families to apologise. That appears from page 186 of the transcript. I also appreciate that Mr Highland yesterday gave evidence, perhaps in general terms on occasions, of changes in practices and procedures uh, that uh, are designed to address at least some of the issues that were identified in the Commissioner's report. I also want to make it clear that I have no intention of traversing the particular issues relating to the experiences of the residents or any engagements that are ongoing, such as the mediation. I also don't want to repeat the findings that Ms. Ms. Eastman very carefully took Mr. Highland through yesterday. But taken together, they do seem, at least uh, prima facie, to demonstrate the following. Sunnyfield preferred its own interests to those of residents, including its desire to preserve its own reputation. It did not have sufficiently thorough processes to check the suitability or work records of staff that it engaged. It did not have appropriately robust systems to supervise staff and to prevent a toxic culture developing at the particular house that was the subject of evidence. Sunnyfield's responses to complaints were defensive and hostile, leading to Ms. Cudahy's grossly inappropriate labelling of Eliza as querulant. The composition of the board, specifically the absence of persons with lived experience of disability, significantly impeded the board's ability to discharge its responsibilities effectively. Clients were insufficiently involved in the decision-making processes. It's also perhaps not insignificant that the report found that the former CEO gave the impression that she was reluctant to accept that Sunnyfield bore significant responsibility for the abuse that occurred. That appears uh, at uh, paragraph 32. Commissioners also did not accept Ms Cudahy's evidence on certain significant matters. That appears at paragraph 37. In uh, the, uh, uh, the evidence given by Mr Highland yesterday, in response to a question from uh, Ms Eastman, page 187 of the transcript, uh, Mr Highland said that uh, the one improvement that I think is going to make the most difference is what I would call an inclusive governance model which means the voice of our clients are included at every level of the organisation, from the board through to senior management, through to middle management and the front line. In response uh, to a question from me on the same page, 
when I asked what view did you form on the basis of the Commissioner's report about the organisation, Mr Highland said, my view was that the organisation really needed to work on understanding the voice of its client. It needed to work on its culture and it needed to work on its communication. And then he said, I'll stop there. Taking all these things together, um, it rather suggests an organisation that lacked effective leadership and failed to develop a culture response, uh, responsive to its responsibility to support its clients and protect them from violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. Although Mr Highland has given evidence of some changes of procedures and policies, what seems to me to be striking, subject to anything you wish to say in due course about it, is nobody seems to have been held accountable. The former CEO, Ms Cudahy, resigned, but that was for the purpose of taking up a position as the Chief Executive Officer of New South Wales Trustee and Guardian in August 2022. The board, in a public announcement on the 14th of June, expressed appreciation for all her contributions and wished her well. There's no evidence uh, that Ms Cudahy was ever reprimanded or disciplined uh, by the board for her part in what seemed to have been institutional failures. No senior staff, as far as uh, I'm aware from the evidence, have been dismissed or repr reprimanded for the role they may have played in the institutional failings. The board, as Mr Highland said yesterday, has issued no public statement or statement to staff regretting the failures of the past and acknowledging responsibility. The board remains largely unchanged. Ten months after have, uh, uh, having elapsed since the report, there have only been two changes and the board has not rectified a glaring defect identified in the report, namely no person with disability on the board and the chair retains her position. The question I want to put to you, and I'm not asking for a response right now, but within a very short time in writing, is there any reason why the final report of this Royal Commission should not find that the Board of Sunnyfield has neither accepted nor appropriately attributed responsibility to the institutional deficiencies and failings that led to the experiences of the residents and families recounted in the Commissioner's report on the public hearing. That's what I want to put to you. Obviously, you should have an opportunity to respond. As I say, I don't expect you to respond now, but within a short period, probably within the space of a week or so, uh, I would invite you to make any written response you wish on behalf of Sunnyfield to what I've just put to you. C certainly, Chair. I'd like to avail myself of that opportunity to put something in writing, and uh, you've raised some issues of some complexity that I think would more appropriately be dealt with on proper instruction and uh, in a document, perhaps in, in seven days, we could achieve that. Yes, thank you very much. That, that's what I anticipated, and that's perfectly reasonable. Thank you. Please, the Yes, Ms Eastman, I'm sorry to have taken up that time, but uh, that is something I wanted to put. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, um, Commissioners, and good morning to everybody <coughs> following the proceedings. Commissioners will see that we have three witnesses forming a panel, and they join us this morning to continue the uh, inquiry in relation to service providers and workforce issues. Commissioners, yesterday we examined the practices of some service providers with respect to recruitment, initial onboarding and some of the features of their organisation with respect to their employees. We didn't touch in detail yesterday on the issues of training, supervision, retention and overall management of the workplace. And that those are the issues that I want to examine with the three members of the panel this morning. Mr Highland, you've returned. Thank you. Um, Ms Kadich, Kadak, Kadak, thank you very much for joining us. I'll introduce you in a moment. And Ms Tui, thank you for joining us. Uh, commissioners, you'll see Ms Tui has returned to the Royal Commission. She is the CEO of Afford and... Commissioners uh, have completed their hearing report in relation to Afford, but it's yet to be published on the Royal Commission's website. I'm going to ask Ms Tui some questions arising from the uh, findings of the Royal Commission uh, to the extent that the rest of us, and I think Ms Tui has a copy of the mm. report, uh, I will refer to council assisting submissions and affords response to those submissions 
and those documents are available on the Royal Commission's website. So can I start? Uh, Just before you commence, thank you very much to each of you uh, in two cases, I think, uh, for uh, returning. Mr Highland, uh, a rather swift return from yesterday. Uh, thank you for your contributions, which uh, you have made and would no doubt will make uh, during the course of the morning. I'll ask now Ms Eastman to ask you some questions. Right. So, Ms Caddock, can I start with you? Sure. Um, and I think all the witnesses have given their respective I'm votes sorry. and affirmations. So you are the CEO of an organisation called the Araluan Centre. Correct. That's an, um, a, an organisation that's incorporated as a company limited by guarantee. Correct. Is that right? Is it also a charity? Yes. And how long have you held the CEO's position? Since 2019. And how long have you... Uh, worked in the disability sector before taking on that role? Uh, I've been in the sector for around 30 years. Uh, I've been at Araluan for 27 years. Right. And in terms of Araluan, it initially began in the 1960s by a group of parents who started a play group for their children in a garage. Is that right? Correct. And the parents believed that there, was, uh, there should be better options for their children with disability, and that led to uh, the formation of Araluan. Okay. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about Araluan. You've responded to a notice from the Royal Commission, and are we right in understanding that Araluan supports 322 uh, people with disability? Correct. And what are the nature of the services provided to the 326 people? So we do have one SDA property. We provide supported independent living, day support and support coordination. And in terms of the workers to support people with disability, there are 221 workers, of which 194 provide direct support. Correct. And based on the information provided to the Royal Commission, the majority of the uh, employees who provide direct support are employed on a part-time basis, about correct. 113, is that right? Yes, that's correct. We um, asked you about some information in relation to the number of employees who are people living with disability, and your records indicate that you don't record that information no. in your system and that you don't ask employees to disclose disability, is that right? No, we do not. Uh, in terms of other aspects of the workforce, we asked you what the proportion of employees who come from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, and you said there are 56 identified. Uh, so again, you don't ask people, but you've made work, no correct you've worked yeah. it out either because of visa status or something uh, else. People you... have identified that in their uh, recruitment phase. Right. Yeah. Now, in terms of the terms and conditions of employment, the award applies, but Araluan also has an enterprise bargaining agreement that was approved by the Fair Work Commission in June last year. Correct. And with respect to the minimum qualifications required of support workers, so those in direct support, do you require the workers to have a Certificate 3? No, we do not. Are there any particular qualifications that you require of workers? No. Right. Uh, Mr Highland, can I turn to you? We covered some of this yesterday, but I want to move from focusing on the response to the findings from Public Hearing 13 into some of the present arrangements at Sunnyfield. So as at <clears throat> November last year, you uh, have, or well, Sunnyfield has 1,958 disability service users, so people with disability. Uh, and in terms of the range of services provided, has there been any change in the nature of the services provided to people with disability? No. It continues to include accommodation and the operation of an ADE and enterprise, an Australian disability enterprise. Correct. In terms of workers, um, at public hearing 13, we asked whether or not you counted the people who work for the ADE as employees, and my recollection is that Ms Cudahy said they were they were counted as clients rather than as employees of Sunnyfield, and I think there might be a change in the way you describe that in the response, but it has a bearing for something I want to ask you in a moment. 
what you've told us in the response is that there are 1,771 workers, of which the direct support workers constitute 1,590, being close to 90% of the workforce. Is that right? Correct. We've asked you about the number of employees who identify as employees with disability and you've said it's 10.4%. So hence my question, does that 10.4% include people with disability who are employees working in the ADE or is it exclusive of that cohort and it's focusing on the workers who work directly Indirect support. Oh, it includes the ADE. Employees. Includes the ADE. Are you? You may not be able to tell us if you exclude the ADE employees, then for the employees who work as support workers in direct support, do you know how many employees have disabilities? No, no, I do not. Do you keep any record of that? Uh, no, I do not. We do not. Right. Uh, and when? Uh, so when we're looking at that total number of workers of 1,771, that includes the employees who work in the ADE? Correct. Okay. We asked you about whether you uh, collect any information that identify employees from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, and you said that there's no information. We don't, we don't collect that information. Why not? I, I don't know. I haven't inquired into that, into that practice, but something I will look into. Right. And uh, Sunnyfield has an EBA that appears to have expired in 2015. <coughs> what are the current arrangements in terms of whether the award applies or whether that EBA is continuing? The EBA still still applies. So has there been any uh, steps taken to renew the arrangements or update the EBA since 2015? Not to my knowledge. And Sunnyfield's preference for qualifications of direct support workers is that they have a Certificate 3. That's correct. But only 11% of the direct support workers have a Certificate 3. It's a preferred. It's not a mandatory requirement. When we look at the breakdown of workers in the categories casual, part-time and full-time, the majority of workers are in the casual and part-time category. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Ms. Tui, can I um, come to you? Uh, so, thank you for returning to the Royal Commission. I assume you remain the CEO of a Ford. I do. And uh, I want to ask you shortly some questions arising from the here, public hearing 23. But before I do so, I just need to, <laughs> to make sure we've got the numbers in. Okay. So, as at June 2022, a Ford provides services to 6,550 people with disability. That's right. And uh, in terms of the nature of those services, does it continue to be predominantly day day programs, day programs, respite service, yeah, allied health, SIL, yes. Any other um, ADS, changes ADS. to the? No, not at this stage. No. And the workers, uh, as a workforce as a whole, is two thousand one hundred and fifty one, and of that, one thousand five hundred and fifty nine are uh, in the direct. Support That's right. service area. That's right. You also cannot say uh, whether there are employees who work as indirect support being employees with disability. Is no, that right? that's right. Why is that? Uh, the organisation has never collected that information before. It currently doesn't have a HR HR management system. Um, now, what's yeah. not uncommon for this Royal Commission is that there'll be a report or something released almost like on the day we have a hearing about something. Mm -hmm. So yesterday, I don't know if any of you are aware of this, that um, the University of Sydney published some research in relation to disability services needing to employ more people with lived experience of disability. And the research done by Damien Mellifont, Jennifer Smith-Mary and Kim Bookley uh, do an analysis of the extent to which people with disability are employed in the sector and in particular for disability in disability service providers. Are any of you aware of that report? No. I haven't seen that. No. Um, have any of your organisations <coughs> had an active plan to recruit people with disability into roles in direct support care service as in providing services to people with disability? It's, it's not a policy. It is? It is not a policy. It's not? It's not a policy, no. We don't have an active plan, but we're certainly open to people with a disability. 
buying. Ms Tui? No, the same with us. We've only just launched our inclusion and diversity policy and the further work from that is, is happening over the next sort of 12 months. Well, um, putting Araluen to decide, do I assume that Sunnyfield and Afford also have reporting obligations to the Women's Gender yes. uh, Equity Agency? Yes. And you have to report on the number of women you employ? Yes. Um, you don't have to report anywhere on the number of employees with disability, is that right? Not that I'm aware of, no. I could check. You I'll don't have to check that. I'll have to check that. Given the reporting arrangements that you have for WGIA, mm. has there been any consideration in your organisations to take that model to look at the patterns and trends in employing people with disability within your organisations? Yeah, we, would <coughs> we are currently implementing a new... Um, a new set of systems, and as part of that yeah. process, we will be collecting, looking to collect as much demographic information when as possible. Ms. Tui? Exactly, exactly the same. We're currently in the process of developing the business requirements for a new HR management system. So, issues in relation to. Can I to just ask you to slow down sorry, a little bit yes. just for the interpreter? No, I know fine. I'm going very quickly today. No, but that's okay. If you could that's slow okay. down, please, I'll do the same. Yeah, no, that's fine. No, we're exactly the same as Andrew. Uh, those areas have, um, will be covered off uh, in our new HR management system. We're aware that there's deficiencies there at present. When you advertise uh, positions that might be available, do you specifically invite people with disability to apply? No. Why not? We just have an open recruitment for anyone who's willing to apply. We don't specify those all, details. All of you are in the business of providing services to people with disability. Uh, would it not make both commercial sense uh, to have people with disability as employees as part of the business to give that perspective of lived experience? Absolutely. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yes. What would you each need to do to make a change to actively target in your recruitment people with disability? Well, it's, it's pretty simple. We just need to make a policy change and just do it. Um, what policy change would you need to make? Um, we would just need to make a policy change that would uh, specify that um, inclusivity of all types, not just disability, is part of our recruitment process. Ms Tui? Uh, yes, I mean, we've done it in our head office environment because we've replaced about 80% of our employees in our head office environment over the last 15 months. So. Um, the instructions given to the external recruiters was um, to also be open to employment for people with disability and we currently have around 10 uh, employees that have joined us over the last 12 months in our head office environment. So again, it's just about changing the practice for our direct support workers. Um, and in the last 12 months, the organisation has also embraced our support employees as part of our uh, employee workforce as well. Um, right, so, so I'm just going to ask you these questions based on yeah. employing people with disability, not yeah. people with disability to whom you provide services. Yeah. If you assume that there's probably one area of discrimination law where you can positively uh, discriminate or favour, it's the area of disability. Mm -hmm. So our discrimination laws do not make it unlawful to treat a person without disability less favourably than a person with disability. So take that as a given. Yeah. There's no... You're not aware of any legal restraints on you actively targeting people with disability in employment, are you? No. In terms of then employing a person with disability, do each of your organisations have uh, policies in relation to reasonable adjustments that may be provided to an employee with disability? Mr Highland, do you have a reasonable adjustment policy? What, what do you mean by reasonable adjustment? I'm sorry. Well, um, you would be aware, would you not, that for an employee with a disability, if they require an adjustment to enable them to do the work in their workplace, that a failure to provide a reasonable adjustment may give rise to unlawful discrimination. I understand. I don't believe it's a policy, but it should be. So that you, there's no reasonable adjustment policy at Sunnyfield? I'd have to take that on notice. I'm not right. At Araluen, sure. do you have a reasonable... We don't have a policy, but we ask every person that comes through our recruitment process what they would require to make sure that they can complete their job. That's standard for every employee. Ms Tui? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Um, have all of you, assume two organisations have been in the Royal Commission, but um, have you followed the other work of the... Royal Commission, for example, the work the Royal Commission's done in 
the employment of people with disability. Yes. <coughs> so you followed the uh, outcomes of public hearing nine, <coughs> excuse me, in public hearing 19? Yes. Okay. Um, it, other than a reasonable adjustment policy, are there any other particular policies or practices within your organisation to support employees with disability? Mr Highland. I'd have to take that on notice. I haven't, made, I haven't inquired on that question. Um, so, Ms Kadich? Yeah, other than our inclusivity policy, that's, yeah, standard. Ms Tui? No, it would be around the reasonable uh, adjustments policy, both in the workplace and also in someone's home uh, if they had uh, working from home uh, options well, as well. Well, let me ask you this question. Do all of you in your recruitment practices have position descriptions that set out inherent requirements of the particular positions? Yeah. Yes. And um, in terms of imposing an obligation on the employee to be able to meet the inherent requirements of the job, how do you uh, deal with a situation where a person uh, comes to the organisation with an existing disability mm -hmm. or acquires a disability during the course of the work? How do you navigate inherent requirements and supporting the person with disability. Do you have a policy about that? Sunnyfield have a policy, inherent there's, requirements? There's no, no policy on that. Ara no. Lewin? No. So it's part of the procedure for the inherent requirements. Um, so the person would be uh, assessed by both their direct line manager plus also the WHS business partner, uh, who would also assess the workplace with the worker uh, to make sure that we're putting in place the appropriate reasonable uh, adjustments. Same process that's recently occurred because of the uh, employees that we've engaged over the last 12 months in our head office environment, uh, for example. Um, that included the provision of car parking, what the office environment looked like, the equipment we had to provide for him to work at home. Uh, and um, and that's taken, like I said, um, that's completed in conjunction with the line manager and the WHS team and the HR team as well. And is there a requirement for employees to have to undergo medical or health assessments either before employment or at any time during employment? No. No? No. You for, do? For our direct course? support workers, yes. Yes, they have to undergo medical assessment. Why is that? So I just why why do they have to undergo a medical assessment? It's a functional assessment to make sure that um, they're able to complete the inherent inherent requirements of the role. If you do that, yeah, uh, ha, in the absence of a reasonable adjustment policy, you're not going to have difficulties. We have a reasonable adjustments policy. So though. how does that so work with measuring inherent ability to do the inherent requirements? Well, it's also making, making sure that um, our employees are also safe in the work that they're doing as well, because we still have an obligation as an employer to make sure that mm. our environment is safe. So, you know, if we're assessing someone for a particular type of role that has a lot of um, manual handling, for example, um, we have to make sure that the person is able to complete that or that we're able to put in mechanisms to make sure they've got the appropriate support or help with other team members to make sure that they can complete the tasks required. All right. So, Ms Tui, I want to now, before asking some questions about training in the organisation, to just come to some of the matters uh, that arose when a forward participated in public hearing 23. Um, you're aware of the Commissioner's findings. One of the issues raised was that from at least 2026, 16 to 2020, lifestyle assistants and senior lifestyle assistants did not always have access to up-to-date and accurate information about the individual support needs of each of the participants at the Mount Druitt Day program. Uh, they did not have paid administrative time to sufficiently familiarise themselves with what information there was about the participants or to complete necessary paperwork and did not receive induction or training focused on the specific support needs of each participant. So in um, a Ford's response to that submission, that Afford said that it accepted that from at least 2016 to 2020, those matters that council assisting had been raised, you accepted that that was the case. Yes. The other was 
and this is paragraph, it's finding 19, but it's paragraph 279 of the council assisting submissions that until at least June 2021, the processes and procedures for preventing and responding to incidents that presented risks of harm to participants and staff were deficient in the following respects. Affords policies and procedures for identifying and responding to abuse and neglect and for reporting incidents were not always followed by the staff at the Mount Druitt program. And then I'm just going to paraphrase uh, that the staff could not always implement effective behaviour support strategies. And this is the one that I want to focus on that training and information provided to staff about individual support needs of day, to, of day program participants was inadequate and this increased the risks for participants. So I've just read part of those findings. And again, a forward accepted uh, the council assisting submissions and that reflects the findings of the commissioners. So you're aware of that? Yes, I am. So uh, would you accept that when we focus on the importance of training, that the training must necessarily support the organisation's obligation to prevent violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. Yes. And that that training has to be effectively put in place at the outset of the employment relationship. Yes. But necessarily needs to be ongoing throughout the life of a person's employment. Yes. And that simply employing uh, in training a particular individual outside the context of the work in which they're engaged may have limitations as to the effectiveness of the training. Would you agree with those I'll propositions? Agree with yes. Right. Um, I do know that you've got a new learning and development strategy. That's right. And that commenced in September 2022. Mm -hmm. And that's supported by a new learning and development policy and a new learning and development matrix that's going to be launched in, in, March, in March, in a few weeks' that's time, right. is that right? That's right, yes. Uh, can you tell us how the strategy, the policy and the matrix will incorporate training that's focused on individual support needs of the participants or uh, supporting the rights of participants? Is that something that you can comment on? And then I want to come to the rest of the panel and ask you about your training approaches. So the learning and development strategy and the learning and development matrix um, need to be seen in conjunction with also the onboarding uh, program of work that's also going on at the moment, because both of those things go hand in hand, particularly for new uh, employees. Um, with our learning and development strategy, um, one of the things that we did with that, uh, because the organisation had a policy of not requiring a certificate three, for example, Can I ask you to slow down for our please? support workers. Um, that policy changed about 12 months ago, so we now require a Certificate 3. The Learning and Development Strategy, one of the things that it incorporates, it incorporates modules that are currently part of the Certificate 3, so our staff who are participating in that, who currently work with us, who obtain those modules can then get prior learning recognition, um, and that's one way of them being able to attain the Cert 3 that we now require. Uh, the, mod the Learning and Development Strategy has also been developed... Slow down, please. Sorry has also been developed uh, in um, uh, close consultation with our uh, both our safeguarding team, which is new in the organisation, uh, and our quality and practice leadership uh, team as well. Um, one of the other things uh, that we've also done, which is part of our, our onboarding framework, is that we actually have clients who are involved um, through videos and podcasts um, for our, um, uh, our onboarding program so that staff are aware of the importance around particular things that are that are, are of importance to our clients uh, as part of uh, the onboarding and the learning and development program. Um, that's been a, a really positive um, initiative and they get paid for their time for participating and completing uh, those uh, as well. Um, the onboarding program consists of a variety of um, both the core modules that are required in the matrix and the strategy, which happens when they first begin employment prior to commencing 
uh, any direct client work. Um, so that's the basic requirements like manual handling, going through our you know, human rights policies, um, preventing and responding to abuse and neglect, our risk management, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, and then the, uh, the other part of the onboarding program is also that direct relationship to the clients that they're going to be supporting. So what the person's so care and Forgive me for interrupting you. Needs. So if, we, if the commissioners want to know more about the employee onboarding, you've provided to the commissioners a copy of the new employee onboarding workplace buddy guideline and some policy documents around onboarding. Yeah. So you've there's provided those to the commission? We have, but there's actually a brand new onboarding framework uh, that's about to be launched across right. the organisation, okay. which, which will supersede those um, documents. All right. So can I ask um, for Ara Lewin, mm -hmm. in terms of initial training, is there any uh, specific NDIS <coughs> training that meets NDIS requirements that employees have to undertake? Yes, they have to undertake the NDIS worker orientation module before they commence any shifts. And uh, after that, is there any specific requirements that Ara Lewin um, asks of new employees in relation to training? Yeah, we have a three-hour orientation session that employees have to attend before they complete a, a shift. Um, and there's other, some other requirements around manual handling and safe uh, practices in hygiene. And uh, at Sunnyfield, in terms of new employees, is there mandatory training that has to be completed to meet NDIS requirements? Yes. Um, so the new NDIS worker orientation must be completed before orientation. Then there's a one-day orientation into Sunnyfield. And then there's a series of online training, which is probably about another eight to 12 hours of online training that has to be completed within the next couple of weeks. I think in Sunnyfield's response to the Royal Commission at pages eight and nine, there's a very sort of long list of training in different modules, and I might ask you about some of them in a moment. Uh, for each of your organisations, who is responsible for developing the training resources and conducting uh, the, the training uh, arrangements in the organisation at Araluan? Yeah, we've got a learning and development manager that sits underneath our people and culture team. At um, Afford? We've got a learning and development team uh, as well. So. All right. And when you say learning and development team, is it one person or is it a sort of vast enterprise of people? <laughs> it's, uh, it's a mix. So we have a director of learning and development. We have uh, four learning and development business partners that sit underneath uh, her who are geographically spread across the organisation, so they're not just based in head office. Plus we also have partnerships with RTOs um, as well. Okay, and I'll ask you about those in a moment. Okay. At Sunnyfield? I'm not sure exactly, but it's about two or, a team of two or three people. And Ara Lewin? Just one Just person, one. yes. In terms of the training that you require employees to undergo, is that training, has that training and the nature of the training all been developed in-house? Or do you go external to other resources like NDIS or... NDS or yep. other resources. A so blend. Two, you a said blend. You've got a blend. Yes, a blend. A Can blend for us. So, explain. Um, so uh, we will. Uh, we have a an approach, I suppose, of not duplicating effort when it's not required. And NDS has some great resources, for example, on their website, which we'll use from time to time. I think part of the issue for Afford is that part of the change that we've been trying to implement is also significant cultural change in the organisation. So there is very much an Afford feel to a lot of the training that we're providing and learning and development approaches that we're providing at the moment. So, yeah, and the RTOs that we've partnered with are new relationships. So RTOs registered training, registered organisations, training organisations, just organisations, so yeah. we can follow that yes. in the transcript. Yes. yes. Okay. At Ara Lewin? Uh, apart from our orientation session, we use external providers for our training. And and who or what are the external providers? Depending on what the training is, we you know if it's first aid, we'll use St, St John's. Um, it, yeah, we generally go to. We have used RTOs before. We also have a partnership with our local uh, tape as well that we sometimes go to for specific training. Depending on what the training is. Is Araluan a member of NDS? Yes, correct. And yeah. do you use those resources? Yes, we do. And at Sunnyfield? Yes, the NDS have some excellent uh, training resources which we repurpose and deliver, plus a mix of specialised training depending on what the mm. 
topic is. Right. So in terms of that initial induction, is it the case that the new employees will have to complete different parts of the training at various times as they are working? Yes. So it's not like you send them off for two or three weeks before they start to undergo training and then start? No. So is a lot of the training for the newer employees on the job training? Is that part of the training? It is part of it, yes. And what would that involve at Araluan? Uh, we do have buddy systems. We also have um, mentoring with managers and practice leaders on the line. Um, and that's also uh, inclusive of team meetings where that they can learn things. And we also have um, e-learning that we send out to people that they can do um, while they're on the job. So has any of the uh, content for any of the training that's delivered within your organisations been prepared by uh, a disability organisation or that you know prepared by a person with disability? We use the Centre for Intellectual Disability for some of our material. Mm. All of it? Not for all of it, no. For so some. what would be the um, training resources that CID is assisted on? Um, I'd have to check the details here. But, but you've used CID for some training? Yes, yeah. But not for everything? Not for everything, no. At Araluan? Not that I'm aware of, no. At um, Afford? No, only that we've had clients involved in some of the development of um, some of the modules. Um, are we right in understanding that in terms of the nature of the training that uh, all of you use a mixture of face-to-face uh, -face training, on-the-job training, and the use of uh, online through completing modules online training? Yes. Is that yes. Right? Um, in terms of the delivery of any training, of either of the three areas, uh, how many uh, of the courses are delivered by people with disability? None that I'm aware of. Why not? It's a great question. I'd like an answer. Mm. We've just Sunnyfield. not found any facilitators that have been able to do that. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Sunnyfield? No, but we should be. Mm. Afford? No, I can't. I actually can't answer that, actually. I'm not sure. Yeah. You've followed the work of the Royal Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, did you follow the work of the Royal Commission when it looks specifically at training to build capability and capacity in the health service area? I don't know if any of you followed that public hearing or read the Commissioner's reports. You sort of some are shaking your head and some are looking like maybe I have, but I'm not really sure, and I'm not going to say yes in case she asks me a question about it. Okay. So, but, but are you familiar with that? Well, let me put it to this yeah. way: is when the Royal Commission conducted a hearing in looking at the accessibility of mainstream health services for people with cognitive disability, what cried out in the evidence yeah. was the lack of training across. Uh, health generally, so allied health and also in a hospital setting that gave rise to attitudes, diagnostic overshadowing and a range of very poor health outcomes for people with disability. The Royal Commission conducted uh, a short inquiry looking at the way in which training operated in the health sector to better address the risks of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability when receiving health services. Uh, one of the issues that came out is who should have responsibility mm. for the training? Should it be mm. the accrediting agencies that qualify a person? Should it be at a university level if uh, people required university qualifications to practice? Or should it be at local, at the local health area? And so there's material coming out of that report that says one of the key issues is the involvement of people with disability in co-designing and developing training material, yes. in delivering training, and in being actively involved in evaluating and assessing training. I think the Royal Commission heard evidence from the mother of a, a young man with disability who took her son to the Toowoomba Hospital, to the new interns and said, let me teach you about disability. Yeah. So we've seen the health sector respond to this. 
for your organisations, and I know you don't speak for all disability organisations, uh, do you not agree that unless your training is co-designed and co-delivered by people with disability, that you will necessarily have a gap in the quality of your training, but its relevance to the services that you operate. Do you accept that? Yes, I do accept that. I agree. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So what would be need to happen to revise all of the work that you've done on your training and resources to ensure that it reflects a co-design model with people with disability and there are opportunities for people with disability to be involved in the delivery? Mr Highland, you referred to CID, which I know does that work, but what would what would it take and how long would it take to change what you do? How long would it take is it I think I think we can start now. Um, it's simply a matter of employing people with a disability or engaging our existing clients in in, in feedback forums or review of the of the material. So we have the we have access to those people right now. We can provide them with support so we can employ them. We can um, talk to them as part of our client engagement. Um, how long will it take to change the system? That's a different question. I think it will take um, a lot longer to get systems changed in this regard. Well what sort of time frame are you you contemplating to make that type of change? Uh, I think I think the issue of funding will, will come up and how are we going to fund this. Um, and like everything that we do, there's a, a requirement to fund these, fund these operations and um, that will become a, a constraint. Um, well, is it a better way to look at it not so much as a constraint but an investment? Well, it should be an investment, yes. But you can't really sort of estimate sitting in the witness box today how long that might take. Well, like if I speak on behalf of Sunnyfield, I could I could probably have a system like that up and running, you know, within twelve months, mm. you know, with the with, with the proper investment, and it wouldn't be all the way there, but we would certainly have a good solid mm. start. And Ms. Tui, I know a lot of work you've told us has been done yeah. in terms of the matrix and the strategy. And when we've reviewed all of that material, that seemed to be a gap for us that uh, reviewing it is we kept looking and saying, where are the people with disability in the co-design, in the authorship, in the form and nature of delivery and in uh, any type of in involvement? It was directed about people with disability but not involving people dis with disability at all those stages. So is that an, an oversight in the new strategy matrix? Yeah, look, it probably is an oversight. I'd, I'd say um, uh, that to um, have that additional value add uh, would not take much for our organisation to actually put in place, given that we've already started work on a range of different co-design activities anyway, and that we are starting to bring our clients much more into the voice of the organisation, if you like. So, um, look, I don't think that that would take much for us to actually have a bit of a shift and a mm. change. I think talking about bringing the voice into the organisation, I think, Mr Highland, that was your evidence yesterday about a more inclusive model. Yeah. This is probably, to use the phrase, low-hanging fruit, is yes. it not? Mm. Yes, it is. It's a very easy thing yeah. to do to start to build inclusive models. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Should this be a priority for service providers in thinking about training, that yes, it be very much part of co-design and to the extent possible led by people with disability? Yes. Yeah. Right. Uh, can I ask you now about, and it's a point Mr Highland you've just raised, about how training either the general, the specific or the mandatory training is funded. And funding seems to be raised as an issue that uh, training not only at the initial point of induction, but on an ongoing basis, is a cost to operating the business. Do you have in your organisations an approach to the way in which the training is funded, or is it just part of the broader sort of operations in Sunnyfield? Well, it's it's part of the broader operations. It's it's an expectation that we we fully train people. Um, uh, trying to attribute that to the support worker cost model is, is difficult. Mm. I would suggest that 
uh, there's sufficient funding to do the mandatory training and the orientation, but there's not really adequate funding to really to invest, to do the proper investment and continuous improvement, but we do it anyway. What about at Araluan? Yeah, I think the funding model makes it really difficult for organisations to be flexible about flexible about how they do training. Training is incorporated into the broad operational costs in the funding model, which means organisations really have to prioritise training. Um, at Araluan, we spoke to our managers and, and frontline practice leaders around what should be mandatory. They gave us their advice on what they felt was mandatory mm -hmm. for, for workers to complete, and we created a budget around that. So it does sit outside the recommendations of the funding model, but that's something that we have decided is necessary. And at Afford, what's the approach that you take? Uh, the approach that we take, um, which I think in fairness has been an approach of the organisation for a number of years, is that for me, learning and development is actually an investment by the organisation. So I, I appreciate the constraints that funding model may well provide at times, but ultimately this is just one of those areas of internal investment uh, as an organisation. So I actually like to set targets around, um, you know, when you look at the percentage of your revenue, for example, that you might want to spend, how you apply your reward and recognition programs so that you're encouraging, you know, um, particular awards and scholarships, how you structure your, your enterprise agreements so your classification structure can support, you know, the development of those things as well. So it's not... The funding mechanism is just one tool to support that. So just looking at the affords, and if you need a copy of this, let me know. Uh, mm -hmm. Learning and Development Strategy, September 2022 to June 2024. Uh, one <laughs> area that you identify in that strategy, it's paragraph 3.1, there's a series of dot points, is to provide legislative compliance and professional learning and development opportunities and in that, one of the action items is to map potential career pathways and pipelines to promote traineeship and qualification pathways and to develop internal um, learning and development employees to deliver in-house training and programs with nominated services strengths. So this is part of the exercise, as I said, we went through, hopeful yeah. that we would see people with disability in there. But those yeah. items were raised. That, are we right in understanding that part of that strategy is that the training is not just to, at a functional level, be able to do your job, yeah. but your training strategy is also to build career pathways yes. and That's to right. um, have a mode of training that supports retention yes. in the organisation? Yes, that's right. Now, I know this is early days for this policy, mm -hmm. but have you started any of what's described as the mapping Yes, so that's mm, occurred and there's been some changes already, for example, um, in our employees who work in our uh, ADEs. So we've already commenced um, Certificate 1 and Certificate 2 training uh, in, for example, process working, uh, some of those sorts of things to give uh, our um, employees and our ADEs further career opportunities as well, give them choice about where they would like uh, to work and what their career should uh, look like. Um, and there'll be further mapping around that as we move towards the development of our own enterprise agreement uh, as well, because, like I said, the classification structure for me in an enterprise agreement uh, is uh, is one of the key tools um, that I like to see in place, which is about career progression and career pathways. Right. Yeah. We've uh, heard from service providers and read the statistics that some services have very high turnover and struggle to recruit new staff, but more importantly, retain existing staff. Uh, what are the challenges in an organisation that has a high turnover of staff, a high level of casual and part-time staff in um, ensuring that the training is reaching the casuals and the part-times? but is also uh, not being lost by the high turnover or uh, the, the difficulties of, of retaining those workers. So I put that in elegantly. Is it the case the higher the levels of casuals, the more training that has to be done, so the cost return is not good, but you're not doing training in a way that's seeking to retain the casuals and also part-time? Is there an issue around that? 
Uh, certainly for Ford, there was an issue around that, um, particularly given the high number of casuals that we had in place when I first started in the organisation. We've converted around 280 casuals to permanent uh, employment over the last uh, 12 months. We had a change in policy. So the organisation would bring everyone in as a casual when they first came into the organisation. That uh, It's hard to um, have people connect to your organisation if that's the basis by which you bring them in. Um, so I would agree with that. Um, I think uh, the larger your casual workforce, um, you've had this constant cycle of investment that you're having uh, to make. Um, so I think that you know I think that is an issue um, more generally. Um, Do you end up with a, a mismatch in having very you know elaborate training modules? And I might ask Mr Highland this. So page eight and nine of your responses are lots of different modules on all sorts of different things. Is that training wasted on casuals who might be with the organisation for maybe 12 months, 18 months, and then off to somewhere else? Well, is it wasted? In some ways it's not because they may stay in the sector, so that's a, that's yeah. a positive thing, so it's yeah. portability, that's good. But if I was to use an example, if I had a casual vacancy and I had to replace that worker four times that year, so it was high turnover in that service, I'm, I've got four times the cost of training, mm. four times the cost of recruitment, and I've got low uh, uh, loyalty or commitment to the mm. to the service, and I've got continuity of support problems for the client. Mm. So it's a big issue. So is there um, a way of building into the the sector a portability scheme so that wherever you did the training, if you've done your training at a Ford, but you've also got the opportunity to work at Araloo and, and Sunnyfield, that your afford training can be carried through and recognised as training at another organisation. Is there merit in looking at portability of training? Um, my Recognition of training? The thing I like about our own developed modules, organisational modules, is, is that what actually gets intertwined in those modules is our values, mm. our code of conduct, the way we do things at a Ford, mm. uh, if you like. So um, I think that's an important uh, element, particularly when someone first comes into an organisation, when you really want them to connect with your organisation. So there's a cultural element of that to me, for me. Um, so I'm not a big fan of portability. Yeah. Araloo and Sunnyfield, you have a view on this? Probably disagree with my colleague. But yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Well, we, we would support it. <laughs> um, yeah. Portability, I think, is really important. There is a there is a portion of training that is always going to be uh, uh, bespoke to the particular organisation, which is to do with their mission and values. But I find there's an incredible waste across the sector. Um, we have it was talked about earlier where in, in employees work across different services. as well. They're getting trained for two days at Sunnyfield and two days at the board and two days at Avaloon and it's mm. six days of doing the same thing. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, they should be trained once. Continuous training is very important, but to go through that mandatory thing time and time again seems like a huge waste of resources. Mm. Do you want to say no anything in response? Yes, yeah, I do. Um, look, first aid, fire safety, black and white, doesn't matter what environment mm. you're in. Uh, even training like manual handling though, for example, if you look at manual handling training, it's very bespoke to the environment that you're working in, to the clients that you're supporting. Um, so for me, uh, you know, if you uh, talk basic core um, sort of elements like first aid or, um, you know, fire safety, uh, that's fine. But the others, are, other elements of the training actually go to the particular people that you're supporting as well. And that could be very different in organisations. Well, that was one of the um, findings and issues that arose from the public hearing that a Ford was involved right. in, is that there's the generic training, yeah. but one of the core <laughs> issues was the training about the particular person for whom you're supporting and uh, and support around uh, the workers knowing what they needed to do and how they need to do that. And I assume some of that might involve uh, restrictive practices yes. that might be quite specific for an individual. Yes. So I suppose this is a question I come back to to Araluen and Sunnyfield is there's the general training that might have portability but if for example one of your workers says well look I was down the road at a Ford and 
I've done my manual handling training or I've done restrictive practices 101, would you would you just accept that as part of a portability scheme or would you say there's a sunny field or an Araluan way no, that I we think... like to, to practice in restrictive practices or manual handling? Yeah, well, I would agree with uh, with what Joe said in that, in that regard. There's, there, there's certain things that have spoken uh, and there's certain things that are generic. And from Araluan's perspective, because you have a much smaller workforce we as well. Are, yeah. We are a lot smaller. Look, I think uh, a portable scheme would be really good for that foundational training that could set the scene around human rights, um, things like that. But I, I agree that the individualised training really sits with the organisation. Um I think the culture is something I believe that sits separate to training. I think that's something that's embedded in an organisation and I don't believe it's something you can learn from training. Um, that's something I think an organisation should be taking on board throughout the whole organisation regardless of training. Well, on that point, I don't know if uh, you were present or you followed the panel of the advocates who spoke uh, to the Royal Commission earlier in the mm -hmm. week. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I asked them about their skills, qualification and training to become advocates. And um, I think there's some training that they needed to do, but they said the soft skills are very important in yes. building the relationship. Um, do you think that those same um, issues arise for support workers in terms of the soft skills? And how do you train for that? Yes, I would agree. And how do you do the training on the soft skills? I think the soft skills are on the job They're and it's around job. mentoring yeah. and buddy shifts. Um, in our group or day services, it's a lot easier because often the staff are working alongside someone. So you can buddy someone who's fairly new to the organisation with an experienced staff member. How, can, can I just say, how do you do that if you've got a very heavy uh, bent towards casuals or part-timers? So does the buddy system work that if you've got a high turnover, that the person who's the buddy might be another casual who started six weeks before? Is that... No, that no it's generally it someone that's passed their probation, their six-month probation yeah. period. And we're trying to align people with different buddies so they're learning different skills and seeing different ways. Okay. Uh, so my last question on training before I ask you about some staffing arrangements is, uh, for each of you, what do you think is the most important or valuable training that your support workers uh, receive to be able to do their jobs effectively? Ms. Tui. For me, it would be, it would be training around um, human rights, communication, um, some of the soft skill stuff, which actually goes to the how they work, you know, how people work and how people interact mm -hmm. with someone with a disability. That, for me, is the most important element of any training. Yeah. From our allowance perspective? Yeah, I would say, look, it would be around choice and decision making and assisting people to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And from Sunnyfield? Human rights. If you understand fundamental human rights of people with mm -hmm. disability, then that's the that gives you the avenue to to do the right thing most of the time, all of the time. All right. Uh, Ms Eastman, just before you move on to another topic, Ms Tui, um, Ms Eastman has drawn your attention to the council assisting submissions and uh, there were findings, as you will know, in the report of which you have a copy to correspond to the issues that Ms Eastman has raised. Uh, are you able to say whether, uh, and if so, what, uh, a forward is done in response to those specific issues that were identified as deficiencies? In relation to which findings? Training, the ones that uh, uh, from 2016 to 2020, lifestyle assistance and senior lifestyle assistance didn't have ac ac access to up-to-date information about individual support needs, didn't receive induction or training focused on the specific support needs of each participant or on the rights of people with disability and uh, <coughs> findings about at least until June 2021, the processes and procedures for preventing and responding to incidents that presented risk of harm were deficient in a number of respects that uh, Ms Eastman, I think, yeah. identified. So the in relation is, 
did a Ford, has yep. a Ford taken any steps specifically in response to those matters? Yes. So in relation to um, the staff having access to up-to-date client information, all staff have access uh, to all client information uh, on our client management system. So um, there is absolutely no reason at all why any staff member shouldn't have access to that information now. Uh, in relation to the um, findings uh, that were around uh, incident management uh, and um, uh, our response um, to those particular incidents. So um, we have, um, as you know, put in place uh, a new team in the organisation which has been in place for the last 12 months, which is our experience, practice and safeguarding team. Um, that team has, you know, in conjunction with the rest of the organisation, including the board and the senior leadership of the organisation, we've put in place uh, brand new incident management policies and procedures. Um, that also includes critical incident investigations, critical incident investigation training, the appointment of external um, investigators that are um, qualified to do investigations in relation to uh, abuse, for example, which I think we touched on in the first um, in the first hearing. Um, the incident management um, policies and procedures um, that has been um, uh, put in place right across the organisation. There was an extensive training program that has been put in place. Uh, those incidents and reportable incidents are now monitored by that um, central team for the quality and the response um, of the work that's happening. Uh, and what we're also finding is that the organisation now is using that internal central team, particularly around practice leadership, safeguarding and behaviour support. They're using that team for advice a lot uh, now, which is great because that's what we wanted uh, to happen uh, with, that, uh, with that team. The training uh, changes that you've referred to this morning in response to questions from Ms Eastman, were they... Are they uh, changes that uh, were in force or, in, or had been commenced at least prior to the hearing, public hearing 23, or...? They, they, had, they, had, they had started. Um, we realised that we had to uh, cease the red alert system. That was a flag when I first came into the organisation, that the red alert incident management system that they had in place um, had to go, and to do that, we had to put in place a new incident management uh, system. No, I'm talking more about training here. The, the training happened post the hearing. Yeah, post, post the hearing. Post the hearing, yeah. yeah. And uh, was it prompted by anything at the hearing? Uh, yes, uh, it, it was in relation to our handling, particularly in relation to uh, critical incidents. So how the organisation actually responds at the time of notification of an incident, uh, how it supports both our employees, our clients, our families. Um, you know, as was highlighted in the last hearing, the organisation's response to the incident itself um, was a significant failing for the organisation. Uh, so that that all of that process has now stepped out very clearly in terms of how we um, how we manage those things, how we support people, how we communicate. Uh, and um, the critical incident investigation uh, component uh, for me was probably the most critical thing uh, that came out of the hearing in relation to incident management. Thank you very much. Yes. So I want to turn to the issue of staffing arrangements, resourcing of staff, uh, rostering and supervision. So, Ms Tui, at the uh, public hearing 23, uh, you said this. <clears throat> so, you know, we completely accept that the current work administration workload of our frontline staff is, dis is disproportionate and has, and has to cease. Staff not having time to do administration work. The new Chief Operations Officer has already identified that as an issue. Where we are expecting staff to have administration activities as part of their role, We've got to ensure that they actually have the right amount of time to do it. I do not expect staff to work home, to take work home after hours. It's unacceptable for our frontline staff to be taking work home because we don't allocate the time that they need in their day to complete what we're asking them to do in their role. And that um, arose in response to some evidence that the witness Diane gave in saying that as team leaders, our jobs are meant to lead a team. Yep. That's what the job is, but we're stuck behind computer screens. We aren't able to catch our staff. 
We weren't able to look at them, you know. We weren't able to see, you know, the pattern of behaviour with our participants when matched with certain staff and they were left vulnerable and open because of that. So you recall that evidence. Ms Eastman, would you mind giving the transcript reference for that quote? Uh, I'll have to... The transcript reference for Diane's evidence is a transcript from the 16th of May 2022 at page 173. I haven't got yeah. the line number. And I'll have to turn up the... Uh, That's right, in due, in due course. <coughs> Thank you. But it linked then to the, a finding uh, that between 2018 and 2021, team leaders at the Mount Druitt Day Program were required to discharge significant and sometimes overwhelming administrative, financial and managerial responsibilities. And I think that uh, a Ford accepted... Uh, that not all team leaders were sufficiently trained and skilled to discharge these responsibilities. Right. So coming to the way in which, um, in Afford's case, the operation of a day program is concerned is that you've got the frontline workers who may provide that direct support mm -hmm. to the person with disability, but you may also have the staff who coordinate the day program who are there to supervise and administer. Reflecting on striking a balance between being the eyes mm. on providing a safe workplace and meeting these administrative requirements, which seem to have become overwhelming, but also involved financial and managerial responsibilities. What changes have been made in the organisation to address uh, obviously the staffing arrangements and or rostering to allow a situation <coughs> like that to occur? Yeah, so there's a couple of different things that have occurred. Um, so as the Commission is aware, um, the significant restructuring of our head office environment, what that has meant um, is that we have put in place additional resources that look at the centralisation of claiming activities, as an example, that were previously um, devolved right across the organisation. So the way the organisation had worked previously is that, you know, the the probably uh, at least 90% of the administration work um, was undertaken in each of the sites and services. Um, so what we are progressively doing um, is pulling in those uh, administrative tasks that we can actually do centrally and take that burden um, off the team leaders. Um, that's being done in a very staggered and considered way because the organisation at the same time is that we're also doing considerable investment in our basic IT infrastructure and systems um, and then looking to replace or put in place systems that we actually currently don't have. So we're sort of bringing that in progressively um, as that work um, continues. In relation to rostering, um, the operations team have had a um, project activity going on for the last few months where we're actually looking at the rostering practices right across the organisation. Um, that goes to um, some of the other issues that were also raised um, in the last hearing around uh, whether people were getting the appropriate one-on-one -on -one support, two-on-one support, three-on-one support, um, and whether or not, in fact, we're allowing sufficient time for that administration um, activity to occur. Do you um, think that occur. you are allowing sufficient time? Well, I think it's... Um, uh, I think there's still work to do. There's, there's still work to do. But as I said, we are stymied a little bit by the systems that we currently have in place as well. We're working as fast as we can. So at, at Araluan, uh, do you have challenges in relation to support workers or team leaders or supervisors having to balance the frontline care support work and then also the administration, the record keeping work? Is that an issue that arises? Yes, in? absolutely. We hear and regularly. How, how do you deal with that? Uh, we hear regularly from our practice leaders and managers that, that they spend a lot of time behind the desk. Uh, we actually have... Uh, Can you ask to slow down a bit? Sorry, sure. We actually have uh, four managers across our day services and they have full administration time to allow them to complete a lot of those data tasks and we have practice leaders on the floor at the sites that allow them to do some of that supervision and also help out with some of the administration um, we have just incorporated a roster clerk to, to assist with some of the rostering, uh, either in our sill houses and our day services. And we do have uh, a data team that sits behind and helps out with billing and, and making that, that data work. And um, Mr Highland, at Sunnyfield, uh, when 
the Royal Commission heard evidence at Public Hearing 13, rostering arrangements and the role of supervisors in the House was a significant issue, that the power of the supervisor to be able to roster the support workers seemed to have some implication as to whether or not the support workers felt that they could raise concerns or raise complaints in the fear that they might not receive particular shifts. So I just want to ask you about that. Yesterday we touched on uh, any response to the findings in relation to the management of SP1 and SP2 and I asked you what changes had occurred. I think your evidence yesterday was you visited the house mm -hmm. and there's been the change in terms of the visibility of the re regional manners, managers. But in terms of at, at a very local level, uh, is that tension between <coughs> completing the work that you need to do, meeting your administra administration duties, record keeping, and then the supervisor rostering, is that tension, does that still exist? It, it, it's a... It's a it's a challenge for the sector, and I can draw my, you know, my experience on the sector, not just at Sunnyfield, but it's definitely there's always a tension point there, and, um, and yeah, there's always a tension point between the front line supervision, the administration, um, and the roster. So, what what do you do? Uh, because that tension may have a flow on effect, may it not, to the safety in the house the quality of the services, but also the very issues that we've been talking about, about retention of staff. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go back to the point I, I believe I made yesterday about capability. I think what's really important is to have the right capability uh, in the house. Uh, role, role clarification is really important, so getting that right and assessing the roles and making sure the roles are, to use a te technical term, are sized correctly, and, and when they're sized correctly, then they're paid for correctly. And that's the, that's probably the best way to get the best outcome. Is there a, a, a funding issue in terms of the way uh, support workers are rostered that puts a heavier emphasis on the frontline support for the clients with disability and less on giving time to do the administrative paperwork and record keeping? Is that a does that come from a funding issue, or does it come from another? Is there another reason? Well, funding, funding is part of it. Yeah. Um, when I talk about capability, getting the right capability usually costs more, so that will that will use more funding, if you like. Mm. Um, yeah. At Araluan, is that is funding a, an issue in terms of the rostering arrangements and factoring in sufficient time for the support workers to do their administration or record keeping responsibilities? Sure, it's a component of it. Historically, in our day services in particular, administration time was allocated to our staff. So uh, specifically for our, our full time and our permanent staff, they still have some of that administration time, which is a flow over. We can't change their contract. Um, NDIS has just um, initiated a, a non-face-to-face component of billing mm. that we'll be introducing this year, which will be favourable to assisting support workers to complete that. Have um, you all read the uh, NDIS Commissioner's own motion inquiry into aspects of supported accommodation, January 2023? Yes. I think you're all nodding for the transcript. Yeah. So the report at page 90 uh, reflects some research and the literature review that Professor Christine Bigby did. And she identifies that there's growing evidence that paperwork is a growing burden on frontline staff and managers that detracts from providing good direct support. And uh, Professor Bigby suggested that the NDIS Commission should review the volume and type of paperwork that uh, is required from group home staff, frontline managers and organisations and in particular, consider alternative strategies for collecting evidence about the quality of practice. And then there's a, a long discussion about some general practices around record keeping at the at the local site, so within the group home, and then record keeping in terms of the, the centralised system. Some of the problems she identified was the use of paper-based records and forms, frequent changes to record keeping requirements and forms, clear confusing and duplication in the requirements, 
insufficient clarity, different record keeping practices across different sites, even operated by the same provider, and often the physical layout of the home might prevent staff being able to maintain and do their record keeping while interacting with participants. The NDIS Commissioner said that it will work with NDIS providers to identify and provide guidance and education about best practice in record keeping. Um, so can I give you the opportunity of getting in first? What needs to be done, Ms Tui, in relation to record keeping in light of these findings from the NDIS Commissioner? Uh, I think in relation to the duplication of information that's required, absolutely. I think there's a streamlining uh, that can certainly uh, occur. Uh, I think some of it also goes to the requirements that individual organisations put in place. Um, when you're working in a heavy, heavily regulated environment, then often you will put in place um, more extensive documentation than possibly is required because you, you put a risk lens over it and you'll be more risk averse um, in that sort of environment. So, um, you know, I think that's uh, also an issue, but it's also about the systems that organisations invest in as well to try and streamline as much of that as, we, as possible so that, in fact, staff are not having to have multiple entries and duplication of information, you know, when you've got systems that are much more streamlined and electronic, for example. So, to Araluen, as a smaller provider, um, is there either an efficiency in the way you do record keeping or... Is it um, a burden? And what would be your suggestion in response to a best practice around record keeping? We've just spent the last two years implementing systems across the organisation to move away from paper-based because we found that was inefficient use of people's time. Um, I would say the same as, as Joe. I think there, there needs to be some consistency around reporting. Even though we've implemented systems, every time a change or regulation is made, we then have to go back to systems and providers to make sure that change is implemented and retrain re our staff around that new requirement. So I think there needs there's some efficiencies that need to be made from the Commission around uh, streamlining and making sure there's even different requirements across uh, supported independent living to day services and making sure that they're very similar. We try to get our staff to work across all of our services and sometimes they can be in a day service one day in a supported living environment mm -hmm. the next day and there's different requirements. So keeping up with that for our support workers is very challenging. And for Sunnyfield? I think more broadly in the sector, there's a low investment in technology. Um, mm. I've seen that across practices over the years, and that's compounded by the NDIS funding model, which really doesn't allow for proper investment. There's a lack of capability and understanding about how to implement that, those, these types of mm. solutions, and they're expensive. To do it properly, they're very expensive, so we need to make that investment. So another part of the work that Professor Bigby has done is to uh, review and suggest best practice frameworks, but she also refers to a concept called active support, and that's set out in Chapter 5 from page 77 of the report. Uh, have you looked at active support, which is relevant to the way in which the support worker's time is organised, and that includes the record-keeping requirements have you looked at that active active support model, anyone? Yeah, so we, we practice active support and we have invested resources in in guiding that, that practice throughout the organisation. And does the record keeping requirement fit with that model of active support? I can't I, I don't really know what, mm. what happens in terms of keeping records in relation to active support. Okay. And Ara Lewin? Yeah, look not not officially we don't do it. However, I think particularly in our day services where there's an allocation for admin that, that's overhanging. I think it allows for that. Um, in our supported ind independent living, we, we actively give people the time to complete handovers and, and yeah, do that active support. And um, Ms Tui at the Ford? We're currently implementing elements of that at the moment. Right. In the time um, available, Ms Tui, I just want to turn to another finding of the Royal Commission. And this concerns the retention and the casualisation of the workforce. 
So in the period 2014 to 2021, there was considerable turnover of staff and team leaders at the Mount Druitt Day Program. And the continual turnover of team leaders had an adverse impact on the delivery of consistent high quality services to program participants, communication with participants and families, and the resolution of concerns and complaints between families. Uh, we understand that uh, I think this submission was made by Council assisting at paragraph 217 and in affords uh, submissions in response at paragraph 67, you uh, indicated that you accepted that for the relevant period there was considerable turnover of staff yeah. and accepted that it did have the impact as suggested. So can I ask you what has Afford done in the intervening period to address that turnover? I think your turnover is something in the order of 30%, is that right? That's right. 30, Sorry, 33%. 33% the last uh, and I know you say in the response that that reflects the industry, but I think from the mm -hmm. information we've got, it's actually higher yeah. than uh, yeah. perhaps others in the sector. Yeah. So what's what's happening if a third if you're losing a third of the workforce on an annual basis yeah so um i just asked the commission to probably recognize the significant cultural change that we've been implementing in the organization in the last 18 months so we have seen considerable turnover in both team leader roles across the organization as a result of that um, as well as um, some other roles um, part of that um, Part of that turnover rate as well for the last 15 months uh, when we did the review of the casual workforce and we transferred those 280 employees from casual to permanent part-time, it was also about um, terminating those casuals who in fact hadn't worked for the organisation for quite a long time. So that also impacts that 33% mm -hmm. um, uh, turnover rate. Um, part how, do you, how do you ultimately turn this around and, yeah. um, and have a workforce which has got greater stability? It's a variety. Look, it's a variety of different. Um, it's a variety of different things. It's you know, I mean, it's it's not just the overarching value proposition you have as an organisation to make people want to stay with you. Um, you know, the uh, organisation has uh, been through a lot of change and ceased a lot of things that our employees actually felt were quite important to them. You know, some of that performance bonus activity and um, mm -hmm. some of those things from that you heard in the last commission. Um, the the thing for me with this is a few different areas. We've always paid above award, so the organisation has always paid above award. Uh, but pay is not the only thing that made someone stick with an organisation. It's about our organisational purpose. That people believe in the work that we're doing as an organisation. They connect to us. Um, they uh, they respect what the organisation is trying to do. The importance of the person that they actually report to, so their line manager and how engaged they are with the organisation. Um, you know, we talk a lot, I think, uh, and we have over the last couple of days about career progression for people, but I think what we undervalue sometimes is that relationship that our support workers actually have and our team leaders have with the people that they report to. That's an incredibly important relationship. Um, so we've been through significant turnover over the last uh, 12 months. Um, I think the administrative burden, uh, I think the role of the team leader in the organisation was confusing. You know, people came in expecting that it was a career step up into a, a line manager sort of position, uh, and they came in with um, really doing a full-time administration role, uh, essentially. So uh, I think we will continue to see some turnover in our team leader uh, roles until we are at a place where we, we've got um, the right systems in place uh, and the right balance between what we're expecting to happen locally and what we support and do uh, in our corporate environment. Before your time, yes. um, one strategy used within a forward was to create incentives and rewards for employees, yes. uh, no doubt intended to be some measure of valuing employees but mm -hmm. also to retain employees. And the Commission, uh, Royal Commission said... A commercial approach adopted by Afford mm. included in financial incentives and rewards to Afford staff was inappropriate for a not-for-profit organisation because they were unsuited to the purpose of providing safe and high-quality services to people with disability and then uh, dealt with some aspects of how the, uh, what was a program called PACES mm -hmm. uh, worked. Now, are we right to understand that 
that the PACE bonus incentive scheme no longer exists. That's right. It no longer aligns with the values of Afford and it has been abolished. It has. Now, reflecting on that experience, mm -hmm. if um, service providers felt that providing bonuses and financial incentives to retain staff was the key to their problem, what would you say to them? I would say that that's only one element of what actually keeps your people in place in your organisation. Um, does that, does, do you have reward, a view that... Reward and recognition is very important for our staff. But like, financial reward and record, recognition, so that I think financial reward care. and recognition um, as it relates to particular things. So, for example, in place of what the organisation had, we put in place a new reward and recognition policy. What that has is things like length of service awards that have a financial bonus attached mm -hmm. to it, if you like. Um, you know, things like uh, team events. Uh, we've, um, we've put quite strict restrictions in place around how they um, have to happen and how much we contribute. But those things are still important for our people. Um, so, you know, I think that the financial bonus element, um, I think what the organisation missed when they put that in place is um, how staff actually see that as an organisation you appreciate and value what they do every day. It's not just about the money that they get. Um, but that's not to say that things like pay, terms and conditions, flexibility in the workplace, those sorts of things. How can we make workplace flexibility fit a large part of our workforce where flexibility is very hard and difficult mm -hmm. to achieve? Um, they're the things as well that, you know, our staff value. Um, Commissioners, I'll just leave my questions there. The Commissioners may have some questions. Uh, Ms Dewey will be with us for another two panels, so there are other aspects of the <laughs> findings that I'll need to take to you in context when we move to That's the fine. topics on governance. Yeah. So thank, thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner McHugh. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for your evidence. Uh, Ms uh, Katash, in response to Ms Eastman's question about whether disabled people were providing uh, training, mm. You responded to say you can't find anyone to facilitate or provide that training. So my question is to you is, you're based in Melbourne. What attempts, if any, have you done to reach out to the many disability advocacy organisations and disability representative organisations that do provide disability-led yeah. training? What yeah. attempts have you made? Yeah, no, so I, I didn't say we can't find. We haven't found any yet. We have certainly, we do a, a large scope of where that training may come from and we haven't found any yet, but I think that is something absolutely that we can do better at. So, but what you're saying is you haven't made any attempt to reach out to those organisations? No, not specifically, no. We do a general scope of training within that particular area that we're looking at to see providers that will provide that training. But no, we've not reached out to anyone specifically to do that. Okay, so to be clear, you haven't made any attempt in that regard. All right, thank you. No worries. Yes, thank you, <coughs> Commissioner Ben. I just want to briefly return to the exchange between all of you and Ms Eastman on about... It was about mandatory training and, and should there be compulsory nationally developed units on some issues. And there was a different set of responses, but some of them were, you know, we want to do it our way and put our flavour on it. But surely you would concede that there are some issues that have emerged through the Royal Commission that everybody that works in this sector should have the same training and same understanding for example, what capacity building for a person with disability is, the human rights of a person with disability, the choice and control of a person with disability, the incident reporting obligations, <coughs> the right for the person with disability, family or carer to make a complaint and to know how to make a complaint, mm -hmm. whistleblower protections for your own staff, should they not just be national standards in which everybody, managers, front workers, <coughs> everyone undertakes and understands that that is what is, and I'm sure that list that is not a mm -hmm. closed list, rather than having an afford way or a sunny field way of interpreting those, some are funded obligations mm -hmm. and some are legal obligations. Yep. I would agree. 
I would strongly agree with that, and there needs to be um, an accreditation, and as was discussed in yesterday's panel, a career pathway, and, and this is this would be part of the foundation in that. I absolutely think there should be a national standard. There should be a, a body to accredit that, and um, it should be part of your license to operate. Yeah, I mean, I think that they can be core modules developed, a bit like we've done with the Cert 3 modules, for example, where we've taken the core module, which is a requirement of, the, of attaining the Cert 3, and you embed that within your own learning and development framework. Um, there will always be other elements, though, that we would also want to bring into that. So it's not, it's, for me, it's not about there not being a nationally recognised core module uh, but even in relation to uh, complaints would be a classic where there would be um, other elements that we'd bring in that are about how we do things at a fort, you know, how families connect with us as an organisation. So um, I've, I have no issue at all with there being common core modules. Um, you know, as a sector, we've worked with that in the various, you know, different certificate courses, for example, that many of our but staff But everybody do. in the organisation, CEO down... Yeah. And yeah. would understand those things. Yeah. I would include yeah. the board and directors in that yeah. too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A licence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much um, for your evidence and uh, we look forward to the return of Ms Tui. Um, how long should we adjourn for? I'll just give you the transcript reference that you asked for. Oh, thank so, you. Uh, for Ms Tui's evidence, it's the 19th of May 2022. It's page 418, commencing at line 48, through to page 419 to line 6. If Ms Tui would like the extract of the transcript, let us know and okay. I can Thank arrange that. Uh, could Shall we, we adjourn for 15, for 15 minutes? minutes, please? That's all right. Well, it's nearly 20 to 12 Brisbane time. We'll resume at 11.55. Thank you. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Uh, Ms Eastman, I've been reminded that uh, I omitted to ask uh, for appearances. Yes, I was going to say, Chair, I think there are a number of appearances yes, I'll, to I'll, be made. Yes, I'll, I'll take the appearances uh, now for uh, anybody who has not previously announced uh, their appearance. So uh, perhaps we'll start with the board. I'm not, I'm not sure you actually... Yeah. Go on, go well, may it please the Commission, Lloyd, I appear with my learned friend, Ms Lou, for a forward, and I should confirm Thank you. we were here at the earlier session. Uh, I understand there's an appearance for Coastal Residential Service. Uh, that's correct, sir. Harcourt for Coastal, and then later on, I'll also be appearing for National Disability Service, Ms Lee. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I think there's an appearance for the Disability Trust. Yes, if it pleases the Commission, Doug and I appear for the Disability Trust in relation to this will. part of the hearing. Thank you. Uh, is there any other appearance to be announced that has not previously been announced? In that case, thank you. Yes, Ms. Eastman. Thank you. Uh, commissioners will continue with the panel approach, and we're now turning our attention to the issues around governance, which are issues that have arisen in the course of the Royal Commission's inquiry in relation to service providers. Uh, Ms Tui continues to uh, assist us as part of this panel, but she's joined by Diane Capone. Is that the right? Yes, Tell me if I'm right. not right on that. I'm sorry, could I have that name again because it's different from... Carpony. Carpony. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And Ms Carol Berry. Thank you to each of you for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence as part of the panel. Thank you, Ms Tui, for continuing, but you haven't finished yet. You'll be back in the afternoon. Uh, we uh, look forward to your contributions to the work of the Commission. Uh, Ms Eastman, have the panel been affirmed or sworn? As yes, they have. Be? 
In that case, I'll ask Ms Eastman now to ask you some questions. So, Ms Carpenny, thank you for joining us. Um, and you're probably asking why are you here? You're a service in northern Tasmania that supports 20 people with intellectual disability. That's correct. And your business known as Coastal Residential Services, Inc., is an incorporated association. Yes, that's right. And it uh, operates on a not-for-profit basis. Yes, that's correct. And it's been operating since 1992. Yes. And essentially, you provide a range of services to your clients in the northern part of Tasmania around Burnie, is that right? That's right, northwest other, Tasmania. So it covers sort of Burnie? Burnie and uh, Penguin, Old Wisdom. Right, so anyone who knows the uh, beautiful northwest coast of Tasmania would sort of follow your work through to Stanley. Would that be about Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. So uh, in terms of the organisation, you employ 42 direct support workers, is that right? That's correct. And for office space management? Yes, for including myself. And you have an enterprise agreement? Yes, we do. And the enterprise agreement applies to all of the staff, including the management staff, or is it only applicable to support workers? It covers all staff except for myself. Right. Now, um, Ms Berry, can I turn to you? You're the CEO of Disability Trust. You've had extensive experience in the disability sector. You've also worked as an advocate in both the non-government and government sectors. Uh, how long have you held the role of CEO of the Disability Trust? Four weeks. So you're sort of fresh off the blocks here. Yeah. All right. So I was aware that you are very new. If there are any um, matters that you're not sure about, please let me know. And um, uh, we welcome your uh, involvement. Now, for the Disability Trust, your organisation supports close to 5,000, so it's about nine people shy of 5,000 people with disability in New South Wales, ACT, Victoria and Queensland. And uh, in the information you provided to the Royal Commission, uh, it seems like a fairly significant proportion of the people to whom you provide services include young people under the age of 18. There's 642 young people to whom you provide services. We know that the Disability Trust was established in 1974 with a focus on supporting children with disability and their families in the Illawarra area. And then over the time, there's been a number of mergers to create what is now a re relatively a large organisation, the Disability Trust. So can I ask you just to tell the Royal Commission a little about the nature of the services that you provide, but particularly the services directed to children and young people? Certainly. So we provide a wide array of services, um, predominantly NDIS-funded services. Um, in relation to children and their families, we provide um, some therapy supports. We also provide other services such as vacation care services, after school care services. Um, we do provide also in a limited way some accommodation supports um, for people under the age of 18, um, both in relation to ongoing accommodation supports and respite supports. Is there any uh, particular issues that arise for your organisation in providing support for children and young people, particularly in the context of respite services? We have a very strong focus on risk management in relation to preventing abuse and neglect. Um, so there is some um, important safeguards that we would have in place to protect children in particular in that space. Um, but as a general rule, um, there would not be particular differences, I suppose. Um, we would be as rigorous in relation to our support of children as we would be in relation to the support of adults. In terms of the support for children and young people with disability, are there any particular qualifications or uh, requirements that you provide of support workers who work closely with children? Yes, we do provide some additional training. 
um, for those staff members, um, but we do not require particular qualifications for our direct support workers. Um, however, it depends on the level of speciality. Um, we would have some therapists, for example, and behaviour support practitioners who might provide supports which have particular qualifications attached to those roles. All right. So if you follow the work of the Royal Commission and particularly the hearings concerning uh, service providers, one of the issues which has arisen is the uh, management structures within organisations and also the role of boards where a disability service provider has a board and has perhaps obligations under the corporation's laws and other associated laws. Ms Tui, the question of corporate governance was an issue raised at public hearing 23 and the Royal Commission made some findings, as you're aware, in relation to the uh, way in which the board oversaw and the extent to which it had responsibility for all some of the uh, matters that uh, went perhaps yes. not as planned. So one of the findings, and commissioners, this is finding 21, is that at least from 2015 to 2021, the composition of a Ford's board and executive management was not such as to promote the provision of safe, high-quality disability services in a rights-informed manner. And there's a range of elements to that finding, which, if I can paraphrase, included the members of the board had no direct or indirect lived experience of disability and few had experience or expertise in the provision of disability services, that the board directors were not offered sufficient training by a board about the rights of people with disability and service provision, and many directors had served on a Ford's board for very long periods during which the environment of disability service provision in Australia had changed fundamentally and until October 2021, Ford did not have a dedicated team or executive manager focused on ensuring safety and quality of services provided to clients and on preventing and responding to violence against and abuse, neglect or exploitation of clients. Now, uh, in response to the submission that was made to that effect, Ford said in its submissions at paragraph 88 to 97, that uh, some of these matters it had addressed. But I don't think reading the whole of the submission in context that the particular items that the commissioners identified, which reflected council assisting submissions, had been addressed. So, Ms Tui, can I just check my understanding on what Ford's, in effect, position is in relation to that finding? Ford did say um, at paragraph 108 to 110 of the submissions that Ford accepts that no member of Ford's board has had lived experience of disability and Ford is actively recruiting a board member with disability. That Ford accepted that many of the directors are long-serving members of the board and that the absence of fixed, fixed terms of appointment has meant that the board is not had the renewal it requires. The board also accepted that training for board members in respect of disability service provision could be improved. And uh, I think there's a reference to some of the training for board members. And then there was also a further response that uh, prior to the introduction of the business improvement plan, that client safety and the quality of services were managed by team leaders, district managers and affords human resources team. So piecing that together, I think there's been a response to some of those matters but not globally. Have you had the opportunity to reflect on what was put in council assisting submissions, which is paragraph 314, and what you now know in the commissioner's finding being finding number 21, and what would you like to tell the Royal Commission about any response to that finding? So there's been quite significant change in relation to some of these areas uh, in the organisation. So following the hearing and taking... Can I ask you to slow down a bit? Yes, yeah, sorry. Can I also say that you may be aware that there's some jackhammering in the background <laughs> and the combination of 
me speaking quickly and the panel members is creating a little difficulty. So if I can ask you to slow down, no please. Problem. Jackhammering is a novel interruption to our proceedings, <laughs> and it adds to a very rich and varied list. So we'll have to cope as best we can. So, Ms. Tui. So, following the um, appearance uh, last year uh, at the Royal Commission, the organisation underwent a review of its corporate governance framework and constitution, taking into consideration the findings uh, that came out of the, uh, the hearing that we participated in. So, in particular, in relation to the requirements of indirect or direct lived experience of board directors. Um, uh, the other element was around the tenure of board directors. That's also been changed. So whereas before we had uh, no set tenure requirements, we now have three by three year tenure requirements uh, that are now sitting in the constitution. The board charter has also been reviewed. That's actually going to the board next week for final uh, sign off uh, and endorsement. We have, in fact, um, recruited two additional board directors, one of whom has a um, disability, the other one who has an indirect uh, experience uh, of a sibling with disability. There are also another two new directors that are coming uh, onto the board uh, sometime in the next two to three months, and one of those directors actually has a disability um, as well. So um, I think, uh, you know, that's been quite considerable improvement um, in relation to the board. Um, we have, of course, established the experience and um, practice and safeguarding team, which is a completely independent team. Uh, the person who leads that is a member of the executive team and reports directly to me and has no relationship to our service delivery so that there's clear independence. Um, the other thing that has also uh, occurred is that there has been considerable improvement in reporting uh, across all of our, um, both our board reporting and also the reporting that goes to what is now our audit and risk committee uh, as well. All right, can I turn to an, uh, the next finding, finding 22, and uh, this is the issue. Mm -hmm. From around 2015 to at least March 2021, the Afford Board and Executive Management pursued a strategy of significant organisational growth, and the manner in which this strategy was pursued contributed to an organisational culture that focused on growth and financial matters at the expense of safety and quality of client services and inhibited staff from raising concerns or providing feedback about how a Ford was operating. And I think your response is that Ford accepts that prior to 2021, it was focused on the growth of its services, but you made a qualification saying that Mr Allen, who gave evidence at the hearing, said um, that the object of growth was not strictly for profit, but to expand services to benefit the clients. And so sought that qualification, I think, to uh, the submission. It appears the Royal Commissioners did not accept that qualification. And Afford also accepted that under the former CEO, there was a document called the Afford Way, and that sent, set the tone for the culture at Afford and accepted that the former CEO's focus was on growth, which was measured by financial growth. So those concessions were made. Um, in terms of uh, the, the finding, what's occurred in terms of a focus around organisational growth? May I assume there's still obviously a focus on financial sustainability and financially sound practices, mm -hmm. but the sense of organisational growth as uh, a, yeah. a key objective of, of a Ford, does that remain the case? Uh, not at this stage, no. So I stopped all growth when I started with the organisation. We've you still got consent, considerable rebuilding to do. Uh, we're still doing considerable work in the organisation uh, to put in place the systems and the management supports that we need to be able to support an organisation that's going to, going to continue to grow. When you say not at this stage, yes. um, I assume that that's very deliberate and you're not ruling out that there may be an opportunity for growth in the future? Yeah, so the organisation is um, just about to embark on the development of its new organisational strategy, which will um, we hope to have finished by the end of this year. 
Um, that may well incorporate some growth, um, but we're currently doing a process at the moment where we're actually evaluating every service and site that we have across the organisation. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, can, I cannot rule out that there won't be further growth, but the growth won't uh, occur under my watch until I'm com comfortable and confident that the organisation can sustain that growth. All right, the next finding, and... Uh, just bear with me because this is all relevant to what we need to talk about around corporate governance, is that at least from 2019, there were clear signs of dysfunction within a Ford, conflict between its senior managers and indicators that its CEO was running the organisation in a manner inappropriate for an organisation dedicated to the provision of disability services. Now, that reflects a submission made by counsel assisting at paragraph 399. Afford did not accept that this finding was open uh, directly, but accepted the substance of it. And Afford accepts that the former CEO um, was not appropriate, that his conduct and manner was not appropriate to an organisation such as Afford and Afford also accepted that there was a conflict between its senior managers to identify properly the relevant issues. The board conducted a series of investigations. So uh, you're aware that the Royal Commission has made a finding that accepts mm -hmm. council assisting submissions mm -hmm. and not the qualifications raised in the submissions in reply. Is there anything you would like to say in relation to the Royal Commission's finding? Um, look, no other than the organisation agrees with those findings. I agree with those findings. There were signs and signals that there was dysfunction occurring in the organisation. Uh, do you um, accept on reflection that where the dysfunction arises at a CEO level, it then trickles down the organisation, that this is uh, a key responsibility for boards? Yeah, yeah I do. Uh, finding 26 is that the board of Afford, faced with the signs of dysfunction within Afford senior management and the organisation as a whole, failed to effectively discharge its governance obligations so as to ensure the safety and quality of services provided by Afford and to safeguard against the risks of violence against and abuse or, 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 or neglect of or exploitation of people with its clients. Sorry, I'm quite sure on the wording of that. Um, when that submission was made by counsel assisting paragraph 400, a Ford's response um, was not to address the substance, but at paragraph 133 onwards, a Ford set out the changes that have been made in the organisation since the hearing. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if you were present in the room this morning when uh, the chair asked some questions of Mr Duggan appearing for Sunnyfield, but it seems par this finding 26 raises the same sort of issue as the extent to which that acceptance of responsibility yep. is um, important. And it, has there been any action taken within a board to accept responsibility within the failings of the board. Can you comment on that? Uh, I think the um, board has accepted the responsibility uh, for its failings. Following the Royal Commission, uh, we unpacked um, what had come out of the uh, hearing with the board. We, we had a couple of workshops between the executive team and the board to unpack it and look at the things that needed to be addressed. Um, I think uh, the... Um, the board and the organisation more generally in the way we've communicated with families, our clients, our staff, we have always been open and transparent about accepting the findings of the Royal Commission and accepting responsibility for the failings of the organisation. Um, and that occurred in all the client and uh, family meetings that we participated in towards the back half of last year where we went around the entire organisation. And board directors actually came to those sessions as well and in front of families admitted to the failings that had occurred. Um, from the board. Um, Chair, I'm about to move to some more general questions for the whole of the panel, picking up on uh, the important issues on good corporate governance, reflecting the findings made. If, I don't know if you had any questions yeah, you wanted to, to ask of Ms Tui before to, I do. To follow up, Ms Tui, 
the composition of the board, I think you indicated that uh, there are two new members, one mm -hmm. of whom has lived experience with disability. Have any members of the board left since the hearing took place? Uh, we've had one of the um, directors who had been on the board for some time. He stepped down at the annual general meeting in November last year. Right. You were about to say something. Can I just ask a question about the lived experience? Mm -hmm. um, has that director um, ever accessed a disability support service? Um, have they... What... Is their experience, as a lived experience of disability, one in which they've had an interaction with service providers and systems that are there to support people with disability? So they were actually a CEO of a, uh, of a organisation, a previous CEO of an organisation. So, um, so they've been in leadership roles. Um, the other director who has an indirect um, uh, experience of disability through her uh, sister She's the guardian for her sister. She has consider she also has considerable uh, contact, obviously, with the service system uh, as well. But the person that was the former CEO, they've themselves never been on the receiving end of the receipt of disability services and supports. It would be in relation to their hearing difficulties, but I don't know this. I can't answer that in terms of the specifics of, of what that would be. Ms. Dewey, the the effect of the findings of the Commission in the report, uh, which reflect, for the most part, uh, afford acceptance of the submissions of council assisting, in council assisting submissions, those findings indicate that over a considerable period of time, this was a dysfunctional organisation. There's no getting away from that deeply dysfunctional. How is the board, given that the changes have been only by adding two people and one long-serving member has resigned, how has the board manifested its acceptance of responsibility and its accountability for a deeply dysfunctional organisation over a long period? Now, if you feel inhibition about answering that because you're not on the board, I can understand that, but it's a proposition that I may wish to put to a forward representative. That's probably a more appropriate thing to do. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yes, Ms. Eastman. So I want to um, ask Coastal and Disability Trust about your corporate governance arrangements as well. So for Coastal, you're a very small organisation. You do have a board and you've provided to the Royal Commission some information about board members. But you have said that you have challenges recruiting people to join the board. What, what are those challenges and why do they exist? So I think those uh, challenges uh, on, the, on the surface are because we are in a, a small regional environment. Um, it, it is, there's a number of non-profits, I don't know the exact number, around community service organisations. And in, in some ways, we are all chasing the same talent um, to, to serve on our boards. It is a, um, it, it's an ongoing challenge and we want people with the right skill sets and, and to have the right level of contribution to a board rather than just make up a number. So uh, in terms of, of getting the right talent and the right people, does that include actively recruiting board members who have lived experience of disability? We currently don't have anyone with uh, that, that has direct experience living with a disability. Um, it is certainly on the board's um, agenda to, to do that. I think it's important that we, we do that. In, in saying so, the people that are currently on the board of management um, <coughs> It, and one of the advantages of being in a smaller organisation in a smaller region that they do have that direct contact in their paid roles, for example, outside of the board, um, to to be able to speak to people who live with um, disabilities, to have a, a close relationship um, in terms of being um, in contact with our participants. So in Tasmania, there's some very strong advocacy organisations around disability and the Royal Commission has met and heard evidence from a number of people with, who live with intellectual disability 
who live in the northern part of Tasmania. Uh, to what extent has Coastal reached out to some of the advocacy groups like Speak Up or uh, Mary Mallet, maybe still here, uh, from, from Dana in, in its work in Tasmania. Have you reached out to the advocacy groups to see if they have some suggestions of people with disability who might be keen to serve on a board? We haven't reached out. We do have a, a good working relationship with both um, of the key advocacy organisations in Tasmania, um, Speak Out and Advocacy Taz. Um, I Certainly I did hear that in the hearing this morning and I think that is certainly an opportunity that we should follow up on to, to actually have, um, to at least ask for that, that support and assistance in terms mm. of having involvement. But I, I do say that we have a good relationship with the advocacy mm. organisations. Mm. So for Disability Trust, you're quite a large uh, entity now. And does the Disability Trust have any directors with lived experience on the board? Yes, we do. We have one director with lived experience on our board. One out of? Uh, nine uh, or eight at the moment. We do have a vacancy. Um, we do have uh, one person with lived experience. We also have um, three other board members who are parents and carers of people with disability. In terms of uh, each of your organisations, do you accept that both uh, the value to your organisations but also public confidence in the organisations that you operate would be enhanced by increasing the number of people with disability in leadership roles on the board? Absolutely. Would you all accept that? Yes. And uh, to the extent that... Uh, often it's said we don't know who people with disability are who may serve on the board. Do you accept that that might be a hollow excuse given that the uh, relevant ABS statistics tell us that there are over 4 million people with disability who live in Australia? Do you accept that? Yes. Have um, any of you had any involvement in the recent initiatives of the Australian Institute of Company Directors which has set up a scholarship to uh, promote and support leaders with disability to uh, acquire the skills if they have an interest in taking on leadership roles, including as company directors. Are you all aware of that program? Yes, and we have been actively yeah. uh, looking into that to create an opportunity um, for somebody to be able to participate. Yes. I'm um, probably for coastal. I accept that probably seems a little distant, but are you aware that there is a, a program run by the Institute of Company Directors with the scholarship scheme? I'm not, but as a member, I hope will be. And uh, the Royal Commission has heard from an organisation that Christina Ryan operates called the Disability Leadership Institute. Have um, any of your organisations reached out to the Institute to make inquiries as to people who may be keen to serve on boards um, who live with disability? Is that a resource that you've used? Anyone? No, we have Ms. not. Ms. Tui, you're writing no, down not, the names. No, no I am I'm writing, madly writing down. Um, no, we haven't. But in fact, one of our new directors who's starting in three months is actually one of the... Um, recipients of the scholarship from the ARCD okay. program. So we're, we're her first board appointment. Okay. In terms of uh, skills for the board, and I think you've just mentioned that it's an issue for Coastal, is has the practice in the organisations been to very much sort of focus on what might be traditional skills of directors and there's a sort of perhaps a default to the accountants, the lawyers and those who've got corporate experience? I think traditionally that has been our approach. Um, it, it's you know, looking at it as a litigious environment that we have um, sought those as, as the first um, port of call. But I do think that, and it's it's not that it's been too hard to look for somebody with a disability, and I think we need to, to find a way to make it work um, and, and to have somebody with a multitude of skill sets, as you said. Why is it a litigious environment? I think there's been a perception that um, that boards of management have been um, it, it's 
it's been an environment like that, and I think that's where we need to make that shift away from from you having. Mean the, you mean the boards of corporations generally? Yes. Have found themselves sometimes to be the subject of legal action. Yes. Okay. Uh, in terms of disability trust, you provided in response to a notice a document described as a skills matrix and accepting there's some confidential information in there and I don't want to identify any particular individual on the board, is the skills matrix uh, addresses the following areas. Skills of your directors in lived experience and care of voice, <coughs> Did the disability sector, leadership values and ethics, corporate competencies and risk management, can you tell us how did this risk, uh, how the skills matrix developed and the focus on these particular areas? Yes. So this skills matrix was developed um, by our governance committee, which is one of the um, committees of our board. Um, we do have lived experience in the care of voice and the disability sector experience at the top of that skills matrix um, because we do prioritise that. Um, but otherwise, you know, it's important that we have a balance of people on our board, um, but the Disability Trust has always prioritised um, having a person, at least one person with lived experience on our board. Um, and likewise, we also value the voice of parents and carers. Our organisation was built um, by uh, people with disability and their families, um, and so we strongly value that perspective. Uh, in terms of uh, a forward, I know I've asked you some questions, Ms. Tui, about this, but has there been uh, an exercise done by a forward to look at a skills matrix in terms of the current board composition? And as you've said, mm -hmm. there may be fixed terms for directors and whether that would have a bearing on identifying what skills are required? Yes, so the board actually underwent a formal board evaluation process at the end of 2022. Uh, that was actually run by the AOCD. Uh, part of the work that's come out of that is not just the work around the evaluation outcomes, but also the development of a comprehensive um, board skills matrix. So that responsibility is sitting with the People and Culture Committee. Yeah, and it's on the Organisational Corrective Actions Register as well. Right, so related to skills, often there's an assumption that if you've got the sort of usual profile of a director, then yeah. tick to the skills and yeah. not much training. Um, and accepting that sometimes that the directors are there in a voluntary capacity and sometimes they may be remunerated. To what extent do you all think that training for directors who serve on boards that provide disability services is a, a core element of ensuring the board is going to work effectively. You're all nodding. Yep. Okay, so what sort of training for Coastal do your directors need and what training do you do? Certainly, well, um, in terms of our directors, the induction processes, it is, um, human rights is, is, is an obvious, um, and it is a standing agenda item at all meetings. I think sometimes that... Um, Human rights is taken for granted that everybody understands that. So I think it, that's why it's important that we actually open that for discussion at all our meetings. Um, worker orientation uh, module training, so NDIS um, compulsory modules, I ask all our board members to do because I think it's important for them uh, to have an understanding of the environment um, in which the, our staff work, but also um, the environment in which our participants live and work. For Disability Trust? So we provide a comprehensive induction for our directors, um, which does include visits to the services that we provide. Um, we also provided some specific human rights training for our board last year, um, which was quite a comprehensive overview um, and, and really looked at um, the delivery of disability services within the context of an international human rights framework. How, what was the nature of that training? How was that done and what did it cover? So it covered a number of topics um, from governance down to um, really all of those requirements under the NDIS practice framework. Um, so it was delivered by an external organisation. Um, it was called Right On Board. 
um, delivered by an organisation called Purpose for Work, or Purpose at Work, um, and that was a, it, it required, it was compulsory training, um, and it covered a number of sessions, it went over a period of time, um, and was a comprehensive overview of, of a human rights approach to the delivery of services. Did that training cause any of the board directors to change the way in which uh, they were thought about, and I'm not asking you to be in their minds, but the way in which they approach discharging their duties? We have had a strong focus on the Royal Commission. Um, we've had an ongoing specific committee which has been looking at the um, ongoing findings and topics of interest for the Royal Commission, and I think that that training as well as our ongoing focus on the Royal Commission, certainly has impressed upon the minds of our directors the importance of a human rights approach to our work. In the uh, current skills matrix, there's topics that would lend themselves to understanding a human rights approach, but it's not there in black and white, is it, that there is a requirement that the directors have particular skills or training in human rights. Is that right? Yes, I think that's right. I mean, the fact that we do prioritise at the top of that skills matrix uh, a knowledge and understanding and appreciation of lived experience in carer voice and the disability sector, I think um, we certainly do signal to our board that that's a priority for us. Um, and we do provide that training uh, on an ongoing basis for our directors as well. And do each of your organisations have a board charter or some uh, published document that's available to the community on your website <clears throat> setting out what the, the functions of the board are in the form of a charter or a constitution? We so do, we do have a Barry. governance yep. charter. It's quite a lengthy document. Mm -hmm. That is not available on our website. However, we do have a statement of principle, which is on our website, um, that we take a human rights approach to our work. And does um, Afford have a charter? We have a draft that's charter that's going to the board meeting next right. week to the final sign-off, but it will and be on the website. Can you give me approved. a sneak preview as the extent to which human rights is a key feature of the charter or not? I'm more than happy to provide you with a copy of it. Right, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Now, for COSAL, a small organisation, you've said human rights is uh, an important issue for your organisation. Mm -hmm. So how do human rights come into the skills of the directors, not just being interested in human rights? How do you link the members of your board who are lawyers or accountants, how do you make them understand a human rights approach? I think that's an interesting question, um, and, and it's probably not a traditional approach at, at, at um, with the board, but um, providing our board members with uh, specific examples um, at meetings around uh, um, examples around quality and safeguarding. I think um, examples around where we're achieving well with uh, with participants. Examples where there's challenges with with participants um, is a way of. of I guess in terms of informing them and, and giving them those real life examples around um, when we have wins with participants in terms of them um, going above and beyond what they're achieving, but also those challenges that um, for whatever reason, um, whether it's a, a human rights, um, you know, discrimination, anything like that, that we can actually bring those things to light. And I think it's really important to have those practical examples for our board to understand that it does happen. Do all of your organisations have uh, a strategic plan or take the approach that a strategic plan that uh, sets some targets in terms of achievement in the delivery of services but also the way in which the organisations operate will work to over a three, four-year period? So yes. all nodding? Yes. Does that strategic plan um, have a specific goal in terms of achieving particular human rights outcomes? And if so, what indicators does it use to measure human rights? So, Ms Berry, you're nodding. The yes. others are looking a bit not so sure. Right. So we, uh, we there's a number of strategic pillars within our um, strategic priorities which 
are relevant in relation to human rights. Um, the first one is delivering exceptional services. Um, so all of our services we deliver within a human rights framework. Um, likewise, we have um, a pillar around building on good governance, um, which, as I mentioned before, we have a human rights approach um, which guides us in our work. Um, and finally, we also have a strategic pillar around a powerful voice for change. Um, our organisational mission is to create an inclusive world, and so we are focused on how we can continue to advocate um, for the rights of people with disability more broadly in our communities. Uh, for Afford, uh, there's lots of strategies and, and work that's been done. Is there a corporate strategic plan? No, we just we've just commenced our process for our okay. corporate right. strategy. Now, yeah. for for the boards, um, are we right in understanding that? The composition of the boards for each of your organisations is different, but there is a function either in the board or mm -hmm. through a board committee to deal with audit issues, risk issues, mm -hmm. remuneration issues, and then a board of sort of safety risk issues. Is that generally how you organise the board, board committees? Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, covering those areas, yes. Do the board committees have access to external advisors? Is that the approach that you use or you assume that the existing directors will have sufficient skills to discharge audit, risk, human resources, whatever the relevant board responsibilities would be? So from our perspective, we don't have subcommittees. We're quite a small organisation um, and um, there just aren't the numbers to, to be able to have... Um, subcommittees. I think um, being a small organisation, I think there is a need for us to, to look outside those and so for our board members to obtain advice from, from outside and I, I think that is one of the things we were, we've been discussing moving forward around how we um, formalise that process potentially in, in the form of advisory boards and other ways of bringing in people because it is a struggle to have people commit to a board um, for an extended period of time. And what are the, uh, in general terms, the systems of reporting up to the board and ensuring that the board receives the information that it needs so that it can be fully appraised of the operations? Do you have any particular... Uh, policies or is it a matter of practice as to what goes to the board and when? And accepting coastal, probably very small organisations, so you may not need to have very elaborate no, communication arrangements. Use it, yep. Yeah, I don't want to use it as an excuse that we're small, that we don't have those um, systems and processes in place. Um, it is um, a, a traditional format of a, a, a CEO report um, with paying particular attention to those items of quality and safeguarding. Um, that, that is a, um, and uh, financial reporting, um, mm -hmm. HR reporting. In, in larger organisations, this may be relevant for disability trust and afford. I think the old-fashioned notion that the CEO was the mm. repository of all and everything went through the CEO and that the board was really dependent on the extent to which the mm. CEO discharged his or her reporting obligations and told the board what they needed to know is something that's been highlighted in more modern corporate governance um, research as yeah. slightly precarious because it very much puts a lot of responsibility on the CEO, but it builds risk into organisations. Yeah, so this is the issue for a forward, mm. and I'll come to finding 27 in a moment. But before I do, with the disability trust, you've just taken on this role as the CEO and, uh, and I think you've taken over from a person who was in the role for quite a period of time before. So uh, have you had to look as an incoming CEO at what the reporting structure is and the extent to which there are lines of reporting that don't just solely go through you? So we, I previously worked for the organisation for two years before becoming the CEO. Um, so I'm quite familiar with how we operate in that space. Um, just in relation to your previous question around um, whether or not our committees will seek external mm. advice. Oh, um, yes. yes. Yes, we, uh, our committees will do that as required. 
Um, in regards to a particular policy, so our risk management policy, for example, requires a particular type of reporting uh, up to our board. Um, so our board regularly receives reports from our quality and safeguarding team um, around um, levels of complaints, level of reportable incidents, um, any relevant data which they require in, or, in order to assess our, our performance and how we are providing supports. Um, so there's a number of mechanisms that we have to ensure that the board gets the information it requires. So if I put this proposition to you, we've heard earlier uh, that for support workers who may not have sufficient time to do their admin work, as they described it, and that they don't have the skills in relevant record keeping, be it paper records or using the electronic uh, software systems, is how are you confident that the reporting to the board accurately is picking up what's actually happening on the ground if part of that reporting up to you and through you to the board relies on what happens at the at the grassroots level. How do you address that in terms of board reporting? So we have an ongoing program of training our direct support workers to ensure that the information that they put into our risk management system is um, adequate. Um, we also will provide feedback to um, support workers when we feel that the information that's included is, is not adequate. Um, we have a number of different levels of management that will look at risk, risk incident data mm. um, and ensure that the quality of that data is appropriate um, so that we can identify any issues that require our attention. Um, so this is an ongoing piece of work for us um, okay. that we prioritise. Ms Tui, I want to ask you about finding number 27. And the uh, Royal Commission has found that in 2018 and 2019, a Ford's board and senior management failed to act on a number of indicators of the serious cultural and structural issues impacting on a Ford's operations. Uh, that's um, a shorter finding than the proposition put by council assisting. But in response to paragraph 403 of the council assisting submissions, at paragraph 132 of Afford's response, it accepted that it did not act on the concerns raised regarding the adequacies of its systems to monitor compliance. So uh, looking at the finding expressed by the Royal Commission, and I don't know if you've had sufficient time to reflect on this, do you accept that finding that the board and senior management, and that's not you at the time, no fail to act on a number of indicators of serious cultural and structural issues impacting on Ford's operations? Yes, I do. Um, would we be right in understanding that the actions taken as part of the business improvement plan, which I think you commenced when uh, you started as the CEO, has been ongoing work to address these structural and functional or dysfunctional matters, is that right? That's right. Uh, to what extent do you think it will take, or how long do you think it will take to work its way through what were quite significant structural issues and cultural issues in a Ford? Do you feel you're there yet? Uh, no, I don't think we're completely there yet, but we've made significant progress. Um, we're probably about 60% of the way through the business uh, improvement plan. Um, but already in this first year, we've implemented a number of changes, particularly in terms of how it relates to governance. So things like the board reporting, for example, the board and committee reporting, it's very comprehensive. We have a formal reporting framework in place now, which um, details out exactly the types of reporting that goes. There's far more visibility for the board uh, in relation to the quality of what we're doing, our performance indicators around quality, safety, HR. The board gets full visibility of all external audit reports, for example, now. They get full visibility of our corrective actions register, they can monitor that. I think one, one of the most important changes um, for me was actually the executive team attend the board meetings with me. I think that's very important because what that does is actually give the board direct line of sight and access to the executive without me having, about them having to go through me and thinking, oh, maybe I'm filtering the information. Um, I, and I think I, that's been very successful. Can I ask you this, um, and I mean no criticism of any no. person when I say this, but if the board is 
basically remained the same with one or two new additions, then is that not itself a, a difficulty in addressing the Commissioner's findings, which was a finding directed not just to a past senior manager but to the board itself? So you've just talked in your answer about what you're doing to yes. support the board, yeah. but how would the Royal Commission see a material change in the way the board approaches its business given its current composition? I think in relation to composition, that's probably a question you need to ask the board. The board. The board okay. directly. Thank but you. I would say that the structure and focus of our board meetings, for example, and our board committee meetings have changed significantly. So the Audit and Risk Committee is the classic example where it was solely focused primarily on financials. That probably takes 10% of the time of the committee now. So they are, in fact, looking at our critical incidents, our risk reporting, all of that. So there, you know, and yes, that has that is things that management have put in place. Um, but I think the composition question needs to be directed to the board. All right. Um, I, no doubt those um, <laughs> behind me have listened to that. Uh, mm -hmm. The final topic I want to ask you about is about the the sort of large number of regulatory structures that mm. operate on Australian corporations and uh, in the context of delivering disability services, often our attention is very much focused on the NDIS regulatory requirements and the QSC requirements. So the NDIS Act sets out a lot of requirements together with the uh, practice rules and various other uh, procedures that you have to follow. But as corporations, you've also got other obligations. Yeah. Uh, for example, as corporate, those who are corporations, you have obligations under the Corporations Act. Uh, how have you met, for example, the obligations under the Corporations Act with respect to Part 9.4 A, otherwise known as the not so new but uh, fairly significant whistleblower provisions? Is that... I don't know, Coastal, I'm leaving you out of this, unless you've <laughs> embraced Part 9.4AAA of the Corporations Act. Mm -hmm. But for, a, I would imagine, for a forward yes. and for Disability yes. Trust, you have obligations to okay. set up whistleblower regimes within your organisations. Yes, have. How have you met that obligation, having bearing in mind mm -hmm. the obligations in the NDIS regime? Mm -hmm. How do they fit together? Is yeah. there a conflict between... How they work? I don't. I don't believe there is a conflict. We have an external whistleblower officer um, who's external to the organisation. Um, our uh, external, uh, our policy and procedure has been just been completely revamped over the last sort of eight nine months. Uh, the whistleblower policy is on our website mm -hmm. as well. Um, I don't think it causes a conflict, and um, I think it's an important obligation anyway. For the disability trust. I would agree with Joe. I don't think there's a conflict. Um, we have a whistleblower policy. Um, we also have a no wrong door approach to complaints and feedback. Um, and our, our quality and safeguarding team um, plays a role in ensuring that there is some internal independence in terms of how some of that feedback is treated. And likewise, we would bring in an external investigator um, if we felt that additional um, objectivity was required. For uh, the Disability Trust, uh, we've noticed that you publish a modern slavery statement. Mm -hmm. So you've opted into the reporting arrangements around modern slavery and supply chains. Mm. Uh, to what extent has that exercise had an impact on your organisation in looking at your supply chains mm. and thinking about those supply chains in the context of any modern slavery implications that involve people with disability? including people with disability who may not be paid uh, minimum wages? Mm. We have, um, we intend to take more of an educative approach to that um, in terms of ensuring that the contractors and suppliers that we use are across our, our statement and our policy um, and that we ensure that they are aware of their modern slavery obligations. Um, that's probably the best I can provide you on that topic. Okay. So another obligation that you have is as employers and a range of obligations under the Fair Work Act in relation to meeting national employment standards, but also a range of obligations around record keeping. Uh, are there any conflicts that arise in meeting the obligations under the Fair Work Act with respect to your employees? 
and obligations that you seek to meet for the people with disability for whom you provide services? And do any tensions arise in meeting those two sets of obligations? No, I don't believe any tensions arise. No, no I don't believe so. And from a work health and safety perspective, uh, the Royal Commission has heard at different points in time that work health and safety doesn't sit easily with disability, either in terms of employing people with disability. The Royal Commission has heard that there is a perception that a person with disability may impose a work health and safety risk, but that perception doesn't seem to be backed up by data. Mm -hmm. uh, have there been any... Uh, Co conflicts or inconsistencies or challenges in meeting work health safety obligations for the places in which you deliver services, particularly if you may have people with whom you provide services who may have challenging behaviours mm. and the use of restrictive practices meeting both work health, work health and safety obligations. Is there a a challenge in meeting both sets of obligations? No, not, not in my view. Um, there is not. In fact, um, the obligations under work health and safety law, I believe, enhance um, our ability to provide safe and quality services. Likewise, I do not see any impediment um, in terms of us deepening um, the representation of people with disability in our workforce um, or in our governance structures. There's, there's no impediments there in my mind. Last one on, on legislation, and I'm mostly focusing on national rather than, say, in Tasmania. I know there's particular obligations. But for those organisations that are registered charities and not-for-profits, there's reporting obligations through the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission in terms of reporting a range of matters. Uh, is this reporting consistent with the reporting that you have to undertake for corporations law purposes or NDIS purposes? So is there a consistency of approach or is there a challenge that you're mm. reporting to several different agencies much the same information? Pretty much the same information. Mm. Yeah. I don't see any no. issues there. No. Okay. And my final question, the Commissioners might have a question, is uh, the Royal Commission recently held a public hearing in relation to a vision for a future. And so uh, one of the issues that we looked at was the extent to which uh, the private sector, and that includes the disability services organisations, have a role in giving effect to Australia's disability strategy 2021 to 2031. And we heard evidence about the use of targeted action plans, meeting priority areas, and an evaluation framework that applied to government. Has there been any uh, consideration of your organisations opting in to the ADS and using the ADS as a model of improving the quality and safety of the services that you provide? So, Ms Berry, you're nodding. Uh, so, broadly speaking, um, the disability strategy, I think, is an excellent document which outlines the aspirations of the Australian community, which we absolutely are aligned with. In terms of the targeted um, plans that you referenced, I think that's a good model. We haven't um, utilised that model, that specific model as yet, um, but I can certainly see there would be benefits in doing so. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think for our organisation, again, being small, it, it is something that we need to be able to share the good news stories that we have, um, where we have um, people with disability who play a vital role in as support workers in our organisation, in inducting new staff, in, in participants who induct new staff. I think it's really important that we um, look at those things and, and find some way to put those into place. Ms. Tui, is there any? I completely agree. Yeah. So uh, the, la the topic I want to end on, and again, we're thinking about corporate governance. Have any of your organisations reflected in advance and think about where disability services may be in 2031? And what do you think will be the material changes required in the corporate governance models for disability service providers? That's a big question. Yes, I can. I'm happy to, <laughs> to start go first. on that one. Um, 
I think a critical lesson for service provision is around strengthening the voice of people with disability um, in a range of ways um, throughout the services we provide. Um, so that's where I believe um, we will see material changes. I think the opportunity to explore quotas, which I know has been mm -hmm. um, considered, I think is an excellent opportunity to um, compel organisations like ours to ensure that we have a voice of people with disability, including the voice of people with intellectual disability on our boards. I agree with that. Um, I think there also is a need for, a continued need, and I think it's been a sort of a evolution uh, in relation to corporate governance, but, you know, many of our organisations are large, complex organisations, and I think um, at times community, and this goes to even when you're trying to recruit board directors, for example, people will often have this assumption that not-for-profit boards, for example, it might look great on my CV, to be on a not-for-profit board, but don't really understand the complexity of what we're actually working with every day and the fact that we are, in fact, large, multi-million dollar, you know, tens of billions, hundreds of millions of dollars organisations. So that's all that complexity that also comes with it. So I think that there's a level of sophistication um, that also needs to occur across the sector. I think there are a lot of... Um, um, I think there are a lot of, particularly, I think, smaller organisations and larger organisations such as our own that grew very quickly... Uh, where you had, you know, board that was community focused from a local community, um, but there's a level of sophistication that's now required in relation to corporate governance. It's no different to your executive leadership team or your management systems across the organisation, and it needs to continue to evolve and grow as the sector continues to evolve mm -hmm. and grow. Coastal, do you I think from from the perspective of a smaller organisation, I, I would really like to see that smaller organisations like ours can can stay and operate effectively from a corporate governance perspective but not lose sight of the, the benefits that um, yeah. a, a small boutique um, provider can give and that's that proximity to, to participants, to their families, to be approachable um, and to be able to be really reactive and responsive uh, as well. Well, thank you all very much for answering my questions. The commissioners may have um, some questions for you. Commissioner Bevins. Um, uh, yeah, my question, I think, is um, directed to Ms Berry and Ms Tui. As larger organisations, lots of money, as you just said, lots of people, a lot of services, um, we've been talking about the representation of people with disability on boards, in leadership roles and as employees as your organisation. Mm -hmm. The Disability Trust is funded to provide a school leaver's employment support, training and are a DES provider. A Ford is a school leaver's, an ADE and a DES. And yet you have hardly any people with disability working in your organisations, in your leadership roles mm -hmm. and on your boards. Do you not see... A, a dilemma that you are funded to do this to help people with disability in their work choices and the skills of their working life, and yet your organisation itself isn't structured to increase that participation actively. Yes, I do say that is an issue. Yeah. Yes, I would agree that's an issue too. Um, there are a number of initiatives that we're involved in to try and increase the number of people with disability that are employed not only within our own service but in other services too. Um, but in principle, yes, I agree with you. Have you and your boards and organisations considered the setting of targets um, to increase, um, which is obviously combined with reasonable adjustments and active mm -hmm. recruitment and working with disability organisations have you considered the target? I think taking a target-based approach would be an excellent way forward. Yes, I, I agree that, that we should consider that and we will consider that. Yeah, we have talked about that with the launch of the inclusion and diversity policy setting targets. And finally, in the public sector, they're required to include in their annual report mm -hmm. the diversity of their workforce, um, gender and including people uh, with disability or culturally and linguistically diverse, do you think your organisations should also um, report that information in a public way 
um, that can be read um, by the broader community. I think reporting diversity uh, is... I, I'd have no issue with that. I think reporting diversity in relation to the number of people with disability, the number of older Australians we might employ, um, you know, that there's a, there, there's a range of diversity um, applications that I would see would be appropriate for reporting. I would have an absolutely no issue with reporting that. Mm, likewise. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you to the uh, three of you. Uh, my question uh, for all of you is, have any of your boards given thought or consideration to CEO session planning that could or would involve a disabled person potentially then becoming the next CEO of your organisation? Mm. Uh, I can't speak you. to um, the, the mind of the board on this topic, but certainly I have given that consideration personally in terms of how I might be able to upskill and mentor a person to take my role as CEO, a person who has a disability, I would be very pleased with that outcome. Anyone? No consideration at this point in time, no. From my perspective, certainly CEO succession is, is really important and I'll take that on board as far as passing on to them that it, it should involve anybody um, that is that is appropriate for the position. To close off, are you aware of any other models around Australia that other disability service organisations might be doing in that respect? To enable leadership of people with disability do you mean? No, the CEO succession planning that relates specifically sure. to CEO. Are you aware of any model? No. Not that I'm aware of, no. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr Lloyd, probably won't come as a great surprise to you that I have a proposition to, put, uh, to you. Let me provide a little chronology. The hearing for public hearing 23 for four took place in May 2022. Uh, council assisting submissions were provided on the 26th of August 2022. Uh, Ford responded uh, commendably swiftly on the 16th of September. Uh, Ford basically accepted all of the major propositions advanced by council assisting with some minor variations. Uh, Ford has only recently received the report of the commissioners, but there's nothing in that report uh, that uh, I would have thought came as a particular surprise. The findings, as we've discussed uh, today, and uh, uh, Ms Eastman's questions have brought out, demonstrate that uh, Afford was, in fact, a deeply dysfunctional organisation and that the board, over a long period, failed to effectively discharge its governance obligations to ensure the safety and quality of services provided and to safeguard its clients against the risk of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. Um, it's not evident on the evidence that we have received that the board has actually accepted responsibility and been accountable for the failings that occurred. It's one thing to try and do things better, and that's very commendable, and obviously Ms Tui has uh, a major role in that. But accountability is rather different from saying we've got to do better. And I bear in mind that in a commercial organisation uh, where the board has uh, overseen a deeply dysfunctional organisation or an organisation that has failed to comply with its legal obligations, the members of that board, not necessarily all, but uh, many would not survive. We've had recent examples with Crown. We've had examples arising out of the Financial Services uh, Royal Commission. So my question to you, and again, I'll take the same approach as I have uh, earlier today, is there any reason why the Royal Commission in its final report should not find that the board has failed to accept responsibility and been accountable for uh, its serious failings. I put that question in the light of the evidence uh, that there's only been minor changes to the board. The structure of the board, uh, the composition of the board, apparently seems to be pretty much as it was during the relevant period. So that's the proposition I put to you. I invite you to make any submissions on behalf of the board that you would want to. And as with uh, the uh, previous uh, exchange, if that can be done within a period of seven days, that would be helpful. That, that can be done. Thank you very much.
Uh, Ms. Peasmith, we adjourn now. When should we resume? Uh, could we? I'm just conscious that Ms. Tui is still going to be here after yes, lunch. It's a long, so I just wonder whether evening. this morning, um, given the length of this morning and the detail, that we take an hour. So if we can come back yeah, at 2:15. Right. Well, if we do that, it's 2:15. All right. It's just a couple that, of minutes. I hope that's enough hour. time. And in that time. Ms. Tui, take advantage of the and opportunity to relax. Ms. Tui and Ms. Berry will be back after lunch. Thank you well, very my much. My thanks to each member of the panel for your contributions today. We appreciate your assistance and it's been a very interesting and helpful discussion. Thank you. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, Ms. Eastman. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, the next panel uh, will address the issue of risk in the context of corporate governance, and you'll see that Ms. Tui has remained on the panel, Ms. Berry has remained on the panel, and Ms. Dean has returned uh, to join us, having given evidence as part of the Human Rights Panel on... Monday. So thank you all for attending. Uh, that allows me of the burden of doing the formalities to introduce all of you. And I think everybody's given their respective oaths and affirmations already. So since you're all seasoned veterans, uh, there's no need for a further welcome, but thank you anyway. So, Ms. Tui, the final uh, matter I want to raise following public hearing 23 is the Royal Commission's finding number 24, which says, as document in the ANSVAR report, the, board its, the board's finance, audit and risk committee did not have sufficient oversight of risk management in the organisation. The risk management framework maintained by a board was fundamentally deficient in addressing the risks to clients of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. That reflects the submission made by Council Assisting at paragraph 361. In Afford's response, in Afford's submissions, at paragraph 120, Afford accepted the deficiencies within Afford that were identified in the ANSVAR report and at paragraph 125, Ford accepted that there were failings in relation to the oversight function performed by the board. It acknowledged that the board should have been aware of the care and support needs provided in its services and that it should have acted on the advice and recommendations of a particular person. So uh, Ford has not addressed directly the proposed finding and now the Commissioner's finding that the Board's Finance, Audit and Risk Committee did not have sufficient oversight of risk management in the organisation and the risk management framework maintained by Afford was fundamentally deficient in addressing the risk to clients of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. Is there any um, response or comment that you wish to make to that finding? Uh, I think the organisation agrees with that uh, finding. Um, we've done significant work uh, in that space since the ANSVAR report actually came out just over 12 months ago. In fact, I've just had ANSVAR back to do a health check on our risk management framework um, just to check how things were progressing and they're coming back to do a full audit again in about four or five months' time. Um, we've put in place a new risk management policy, new risk management framework. There's a whole suite of uh, reporting now that goes both to the Audit and Risk Committee uh, as well as uh, the board. Uh, and as I mentioned in the previous panel... Can I ask you to slow down a bit? Yeah, I just thought, <laughs> thought that in my head. 
Um, as I mentioned to the previous panel, the reporting now that goes to, particularly to the Audit and Risk Committee, has completely shifted the focus of conversation uh, in that committee. So we're only spending a quarter of the time talking about our financial um, matters in the organisation. The rest of the time is actually around risk, and it's around risk, critical incidents, uh, quality indicators, those sorts of things. Um, the board also gets a suite of um, reporting uh, as well. Um, the um, the uh, one of the board uh, directors who uh, comes from a health background, she actually worked with the executive director for experience and safeguarding in developing up the performance reporting framework that she thought would also be appropriate. She has considerable skills in clinical um, cl in clinical governance, for example. Um, and uh, that reporting then also gets reflected in um, things like our performance scorecard, which gets circulated across the organisation and goes up to the board. Things like complaints, restrictive practices, critical incidents. I don't, please. Yeah, all of those sorts of things mm -hmm. um, get, now get regularly reported um, right. up through the board. So with this panel, um, I want to ask each of you who represent large providers about the approach to preventing and responding to violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. As a starting point, is it right that every organisation should assume that violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation is occurring in their organisation? Yes, absolutely. And uh, without that assumption, then it is almost impossible to think about responding to violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation if the starting premise is it doesn't happen here. Mm. So if the starting point is to assume that violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation is occurring in organisations, from your experience, what is the nature of the violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation that we should assume is occurring within organisations? from the disability trust perspective. Do you want to comment on that? Yes, I think that um, fundamentally you need to assume that at any time um, there may be a serious incursion of a person's rights occurring within your service. Um, most commonly for our organisations and for many organisations, um, the issue of client-to-client -client incidents is a very mm. live risk and how we work towards making changes to prevent that ongoing violence and uh, or abuse um, is a critical area of practice for us. Can I ask you, without uh, going back to the particular context in which this evidence was given, but at a previous public hearing, the Royal Commission has heard from a CEO of a service provider to the effect that it's inevitable that there is going to be violence, abuse in an organisation that uh, provides services to people with disability in the same environment, that it's inevitable. Do you share that view? No, I would say that we need to work to... We have a zero tolerance approach to violence, abuse and neglect and that we should be always working towards having no uh, occasions where a person is subject um, to ill treatment in our services. And, uh, Ms Dean, we spoke uh, earlier in the week about a human rights approach and the zero tolerance model that is adopted at Melba. Uh, from your experience, what is the nature of the violence, abuse, neglect or exploitation that you, you inherently assume exists within the organisation? Um, very much as um, my colleague has expressed, um, but also in terms of what we would term coercive control. So some of that more insidious um, violence, abuse, neglect, exploitation, and a good example would be the withholding of a particular valuable item for an individual or making decisions about that individual in terms of them not being allowed to see their family member if they don't clean their room. And I think often not to take away from the seriousness of the more well-known incidents of violence, abuse and neglect exploit and exploitation. But I think it was mentioned earlier in the hearings about that slow violence. So that imbalance of power and the understanding of the support worker's role in terms of we are all equal by virtue of being human. And it's those areas that are much as much as an insidious issue of violence, abuse, and ex neglect and exploitation as an assault. Mm -hmm. And Ms Tui, 
have you got a, a sense of how you'd approach describing the nature of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation on the assumption that it is existing in the organisation? Look, I think I'd probably agree with my colleagues, particularly in relation to client to client as well. Um, I think that's, you know, often underreported uh, generally as well. It's often assumed that it's staff to client, but there is, um, you know, obviously uh, quite a bit of client to client. Um, I think that uh, coercion, that abuse of power, um, that for me is really insidious. Um, is the coercion and the abuse of power not only a form of violence and abuse, but also perhaps a cause of violence and abuse? Absolutely. Um, I think I mentioned in um, when I was on the previous panel about us using the term behaviours of protest. And um, that more often than not is as a result of a reaction to that abuse of that coercive control. In terms of the extent of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation that may be existing or in the organisation, often the measurement of the extent is done by incidents as they are reported. Have you reflected on uh, examining the extent of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation within an organisation not by reference to a critical incident or a reported incident? So, yes, we are... First of all, we have an approach whereby we do have high expectations in regards to information which is entered into our risk reporting system. We also work at having a no-blame culture to begin with. There may be staff members who we find are accountable for their behaviour, um, but we do encourage... And as I mentioned, a no wrong door policy where people can bring forward any any kinds of information which are relevant to emerging cultures of abuse within our services, for example. So we like to move on situations where we think there might be some emerging concerns around an individual staff member, for example, or group of staff members, so that we can address those issues before we, we prevent. Uh, incidents from occurring in the future. So how's that relevant to measuring the extent of violence and abuse within an organisation? Because I think it goes to proactively preventing those incidents from occurring in the first place, which I think is where we need to more proactively use the data that we have available to us. That's a different approach, isn't it, from what traditionally is a reactive model that the response to violence and abuse is when the incident occurs, you move into action, it's that responsive model. If you're moving to a different type of model which is proactive and you need to uh, understand both the nature and the extent of violence and abuse, what are the sort of key elements to taking a proactive or preventative approach? As I mentioned it is about the sort of data that you are receiving um, it, and it could be through your risk management system, it could be reflections from um, staff members, from team leaders, from managers around potential emerging cultures of concern or concerns about the particular approach being taken by a staff member who may require further education or counselling around the approach they're taking to the people they're supporting. Um, so that there's a number of ways that you can work to attempt to prevent um, abusive cultures from emerging in the first place. Ms. Tui, just on this point, I think you mentioned yesterday about the housing stock and the, whether it was you, I think, uh, but the legacy housing stock. I don't think that was I don't know. Well, no. Sorry, I don't I remember who said <laughs> that. It might have been on the panel that, that I was on. It yeah. was. So I think in the, I think in the context of some evidence yesterday and mm. perhaps even on Monday is that the environmental factors are yeah. relevant to understanding and addressing the extent mm -hmm. of violence and abuse that may occur. If, for example, service providers have taken over uh, historically services run by state governments and we're talking about housing, which might be the five-bedroom, four-bedroom yeah. uh, arrangements where the housing stock is quite old and not suited, and I think that was the effect of the evidence mm. yesterday, then to what extent do those environmental factors alone 
contribute to the extent of violence and abuse. So that's mm -hmm. stripping out the person because a lot of the uh, responses that we've seen in the Royal Commission very much focuses on the person who engages mm -hmm. in conduct. But I want to bring that back to the environmental circumstances. So if if I didn't ask you that, Ms. Tui, and I asked someone else, I will let you off the hook here. I'm happy to answer <laughs> it. Um, <laughs> answer but, it. Um, but, Ms. Dean, is that something you want yeah. to address? Absolutely. I think the environment of the house is absolutely critical, together with the compatibility of the people that live in the house. And having the appropriate spaces um, makes a massive difference in terms of people being exposed, as in the people living in the house. Um, I think compatibility is a, is a massive issue, especially when you talk about legacy stock and five individuals living together. When we think about the environments that I know I would choose to live in or every member of society would want to live in, we may live in a shared house when we're at university, but it may only last for a short period of time. So the choice and control of who you live with, especially when you're talking about person-to-person -person abuse... I would agree with those sentiments. I think that point around the importance of the physical layout of a home to enable people to have spaces they can go to um, is really critical. So looking broadly at the causes of violence and abuse, there's the environmental factors, there may be interpersonal behaviours, but have you looked at within the culture of the institution, what is it about the way in which that culture might lend itself to being a cause of violence and abuse. Mm -hmm. And the example I'll give you, I think, was the example that um, Ms Riddell raised yesterday of neglect and a culture of just overlooking the simple things or overlooking things that just, it doesn't matter. So that culture seems to be a contributor to violence. How do you measure that at, a, at an institutional level within organisations? At an institutional level, um, I think there are a number of ways that one can measure it. So the way that we would look at it is we actually have a team of practice coaches that will actually work alongside support workers in terms of supporting their role and the particular tasks that, they, that need to be the priority. And being able to look at the culture, and I think um, my colleague over here mentioned it as well. So it's being able to look at what is actually critically important in the delivery of supports, picking up whether that's being delivered, and then looking at the particular trends that may be emerging. And by being able to use practice coaches working alongside, you can actually then pick up on some of those emerging trends. Yes, we have incident reporting. We may have a positive speaking up culture, a welcoming of complaints, anonymous complaints, protective disclosure. But actually being in that particular home and working alongside enables you to then understand what those trends are and then work with that group of staff in terms of what is best practice, what is important. And maybe having a dirty floor is less important than supporting someone to actually be engaged in something that they're going to enjoy. To, and I want to ask you in a moment about managing risk, but before we get to that, uh, I want to ask about what data you keep that is directed to the matters that we've just been talking about, identifying nature, understanding extent and identifying causes. Is, um, for any of your organisations, is there a practice of collecting data that helps you measure each of those elements as opposed to just how many critical incidents have occurred? Sure. Ms mm. Tui, you've yeah, included um, yeah. in yeah. your response to the Royal Commission uh, a particular model that you use. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, there are elements um, of what you're speaking about that we um, collect. Um, and then that information then is used to identify trends and, um, and patterns. Um, I think the other element that we're also talking about is just in relation to organisations having really solid safeguarding frameworks in place because mm -hmm. elements such as uh, environment, making sure that staff speak up, but also making sure that staff actually have the tools and the knowledge to be able to identify behaviours of concern when things just don't feel right, they have a niggle about something, you want staff to be able to call it out with each other as well. It's not mm -hmm. just about after the incident has occurred or when it gets to a particular point. Um, and, you know, a good safeguarding framework incorporates all those elements, including uh, environment. Right. And, Ms Berry, do you use any tools to identify 
nature, extent and cause? Yes, we would have. Um, we've got a number of um, ways that we have uh, types of incidents that might occur within our um, organisation. We have within our risk management system a number of indicators within that risk management system which trigger particular responses um, by our management team. Um, so culture is a... a you, you need to keep a constant barometer on culture, not across your organisation, but within uh, houses, within day programs, within every setting where you're delivering services. Um, we have a zero-tolerance approach to um, abuse and neglect within our organisation. Uh, we have that culture where we encourage people to speak up um, so there's a number of ways um, I would support Ms Tui's suggestions there that there's a number of ways that you can find out relevant information in order to address any concerns. To what extent uh, have any of your organisations uh, looked beyond models of addressing violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation for people with disability to uh, other areas? And I'll give you one example. If... Uh, people living in a group home uh, have a mixture of gender, maybe male and female. To what extent have you drawn on the work done on family violence and domestic violence, including, for example, the strategies identified in the National Plan for the Elimination of Violence Against Women and Girls, which the federal government released late last year? Have you looked to other models of dealing with violence that may be situational or relational to understand the nature and extent of violence and abuse that might occur, for example, in a group home. So, Ms Berry, you're nodding. Mm. Yes, I think certainly um, from my perspective, the consideration of violence within individual homes ought to be considered in that domestic violence context. Um, it is intolerable for any of us to live in circumstances whereby we are subject to abuse and we need to have that prism uh, of, of not accepting any kind of abuse um, within uh, living contexts. And I think that domestic violence framework is, is a critical one for us to, to see this um, through. Ms Dean, has, has Melba looked at different types of models in understanding situational or relational violence? We've certainly looked at it in a very similar context from a family violence perspective. Um, hence, when we look at um, human rights, for example, together with abuse, um, we look at areas such as coercive control, finance, financial abuse, so all those areas of, of abuse that would occur and would be named within family violence that are not necess necessarily named as such within the NDIS mm -hmm. safeguarding framework. Mm -hmm. and, and we certainly break that down. Um, instead of just using the term poor quality of care, we may use that as a broad term, but then we break that down into the specific areas of abuse that would relate more to a family violence situation from a, a general societal perspective rather than from within the NDIS context of mm. reporting. Mm. Ms Tui, is there yeah, anything you want to add to that? No, I completely agree. Yeah. So at the Royal Commission's work for Public Hearing 17, which focused on violence and abuse experienced by women and girls with disability, one of the issues that arose is how we define in our laws domestic and family violence. And the laws across Australia yeah. are... are different, <laughs> but some uh, laws would capture people living in a group home and they live there because of disability, uh, but other <coughs> jurisdictions would exclude that. Uh, do you think that there would be merit in having clarity that people who live in group homes live in domestic situations and that the way we think and approach family and domestic violence should be the way we think about approaching violence and abuse within uh, group homes or even yeah. long uh, respite services, long care respite services or even uh, ongoing day programs. Would you all absolutely. agree with that? Yes. yes absolutely. The only thing I would add to that as well is that if you are supporting people with cognitive impairment, you know, the importance of supporting people with their um, behaviour as well. Um, so that's just a, an additional complexity, I suppose, which I would, would call out. 
Right. Now, I want to go to another area of law and ask the extent to which you're thinking about addressing violence and abuse within uh, the provision of the services. Is as service providers, you have an obligation to ensure that those receiving the services are not subject to being sexually harassed. And there's now uh, a new raft of laws about hostile working environments and hostile workplaces. To what extent have the service providers, and I'm only asking you to speak for yourself, really thought about that um, group home, for example, as both a workplace and a place where services are provided? And if, for example, there are incidents of sexual violence or sexual harassment, <coughs> to what extent do you have regard to the legal framework in the way in which you respond to incidents that might occur? Mm. So we would consider sexual harassment to be, once again, not acceptable, um, whether or not that is uh, anyone who's engaging in sexually harassing behaviour, obviously, and if it was a staff member towards a staff member, absolutely, there's um, no uh, acceptance of that. Um, if we saw that there was, or we had circumstances whereby a person we support is engaging in that type of behaviour, we would not uh, accept that that's okay for staff members to be uh, exposed mm -hmm. to that, and we would be working to educate and redirect that individual um, to really clearly signal to them over time that that's not appropriate behaviour. What about in the reverse? So that uh, for the support workers mm -hmm. uh, going into the homes, but the place which services are provided, how do you approach the obligations for support workers in relation to sexual harassment within... To ensure that they don't engage in sexual harassment? Yeah, we would have absolutely a zero tolerance approach to that. Um, if there was any information which came to hand that a, per, a staff member was engaging in sexually harassing behaviour, um, that would be immediately acted upon. Yeah. But uh, are you approaching that in terms of just managing risk or are you approaching that thinking about the fact that there are legal obligations? And I think um, you are both on the panel earlier where I went through a raft of different legal obligations and we didn't get to the anti-discrimination sexual harassment funds. I'm thinking about that in rela relation to rights. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's not appropriate for anybody to be exposed to that kind of mm -hmm. behaviour in any context. Mm -hmm. yeah. Miss Dean, in, you operate in Victoria mm -hmm. and I asked you uh, the other day about the Victorian Charter having work to do, but I didn't ask you about the Equal Opportunity Act in Victoria, which has a positive duty on service providers and uh, those subject to the Equal Opportunity Act in Victoria to take positive steps or use positive measures to eliminate uh, discrimination, harassment or victimisation in their workplaces or in the services that they provide. That's been in operation in Victoria for about 10 years now. How has that obligation had any impact on the way in which your service operates in managing the risk of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation? Um, I think it depends on how one is looking at it. Um, certainly when it comes to um, our workers, exactly the same as my colleague said, um, we absolutely would not, not abide by any level of harassment, sexual harassment from worker to worker or from a worker to a person that's being supported, that would clearly be a breach. When we're talking about a person who's being supported, and it's often termed as occupational violence, when a person supported may appear to be engaging in occupational violence um, with a support worker, we would look at that from a behavioural support perspective. And we would absolutely then look towards supporting the staff and supporting the individual in terms of what would the behavioural strategies be. Um, as I've mentioned, we call them behaviours of protest. And we know that that can be a product of the environment or absolutely a form of communication. So it would be about that intensive work to ensure that both are being protected and that we do know with excellent behaviour support strategies, occupational violence then becomes less. I want to turn to risk and uh, the approach to risk. On one hand, the model of supporting the advancement of rights of people with disability is the recognition of dignity of risk and inherent in that is the opportunity to take risks or make decisions that others might not necessarily agree with. 
But you, we also see in the material uh, a view that there should be a zero tolerance approach to the risk. Is there not a tension in the model that says there should be zero tolerance, but at the same time seeking to advance the rights of people with disability in practising dignity of risk? How do you navigate that tension if that does exist? I'm not sure it's um, actually a zero tolerance to risk. It's a zero tolerance to violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. And everybody has the right to dignity of risk. And it's about working together with the person around what that risk may mean to that individual. And our responsibility is to work with the person to ensure that they're informed in terms of what that risk may be and then to support them if they choose to participate in a particular activity that does have a level of risk. I think to support individuals to truly explore and enjoy life, one has to understand that there is risk involved. Well, what of uh, exercising dignity of risk and supporting the person to exercise a choice to undertake that risk imposes a work health and safety um, or a risk of work health and safety breaches, for example, in a group home or the delivery of uh, a day program. That's the tension I'm after. Yeah, no, there is. How you resolve that? There is an absolute tension um, between the protection of the worker, the dignity of risk for the individual. Um, I'd be interested in an example because I'm trying to think through an example whereby um, there would be a situation whereby an individual would be prevented from being able to explore an opportunity that would cause risk to the workers. So I'll give you an example. Thank you. Uh, so assume that there's a group home and there's four residents in the group home. One of the residents who came to the group home late in the piece uh, has a nicotine addiction and is a chain smoker. Mm -hmm. uh, that person can't smoke outside for a range of reasons but wants to smoke inside. <coughs> that causes a risk to the other three residents in the home and it may also cause a risk to the workers there. But the dignity of risk for that person is to enable him to be able to continue to smoke. The um, service provider says, this is tricky for us because in the past we've had a situation where we've allowed a smoker to smoke outside unsupervised and as a result he incurred a serious injury in relation to effectively causing a fire. Now, that's an example, but um, you might sort of say that scenario would weigh in favour of preventing the smoking, but dignity of risk would say you have to find a way through on that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So it would be looking at the external outside environment as to what are the other risks in that environment, as in externally, um, so that that person could actually smoke outside. Um, one... I mean, I'm, I'm thinking through myself in terms of the person, a space even in their bedroom would probably not be possible because a support worker would be entering that bedroom and therefore would be exposed. So it would be about looking at the external environment outside to be creative. I think that's critically important to look at every possible opportunity mm. to be able to uphold that person's right to smoke. But yes, there is a tension. So in that, just take that scenario, which... Uh, assume is hypothetical, is who makes those decisions then on managing that risk in that location? Would that come up to you as a CEO of the board or would that, sorry, CEO of the organisation perhaps reporting to the board or would that be made uh, by a support worker at a local level or house manager? As it's potentially a breach of their rights, because um, as I mentioned previously, our human rights checklist actually has the question, can that person smoke if they mm. smoke? So in that situation, it would actually come up to, firstly, it would go to our practice quality and safeguards committee and our senior practitioner. Um, if there was not the ability to respect that person's mm. rights, it would be reported through to me and then to the board as part of our reporting. 
And what would be the uh, approach that you would take in terms of having to make a decision in a scenario like that? Oh, that is a very challenging situation. I'm wanting to apply human rights in practice. Yes, and see absolutely. How you all do it, and so. it, it's not black and white, <laughs> is it? It's very challenging. Um, we would have to work through all sorts of different scenarios to be able to understand how we could uphold that person's rights. And, you know, at times it may actually even be looking at is there another place that that person may want to choose to mm. live um, if it's that important to the individual. And obviously smoking would be because it is an addiction. So we'd have to look beyond just what's in front of us in terms of the environment that they're living in. And there would be a lot of rigorous conversation around what the outcome would be. And that could be that the person moves. So that, that, that assumes a prolonged decision-making mm, process okay. about a long-term issue. Mm. Um, practical examples involve, can be postulated, that involve snap decisions where the use of uh, principles like dignity of risk sure. mm. and balancing risk against uh, the responsibilities of the service provider do no more than uh, indicate there's a problem. They don't provide an answer. Take someone who uh, is going down with a carer to the beach, and that person says, I want to go in and have a swim, mm -hmm. and there's an undercurrent. And the carer may or may not be able to swim. What does the carer do if the carer thinks that uh, this is really going to pose a significant risk. The person perhaps isn't very adept at swimming. There is a real risk of harm to that person. What do you do? I mean, I'd, I'd expect the staff member to call their direct line manager and ask for help and assistance. I mean, it's... I think So the, the, the person rings the manager, what does the manager do? But I think for providers, it's always that... I mean, dignity of risk, whenever I've done a risk appetite statement with a board... The concept of dignity of risk has always been the element that's caused the most conversation because there's always that balance for providers around duty of care and what is a failure in our duty of care as opposed to someone choosing to live the life they want to, whatever that entails and, and whatever that means. Um, is, and, and even the tension of the scenario you're talking about in relation mm. to you know smoking in the group home, again, there's that tension between it's actually someone's home and a workplace. Is it a home or is it a workplace? And there's that tension that continues mm -hmm. to occur. And I don't think there's any easy answers to it. I think it's about the organisation setting that that organisational risk appetite, being very clear about the fact that we absolutely support our clients to make the choices they want to make and that we will help to enable that and we will support that. But we will not tolerate failures in our duty of care. And our duty of care doesn't have to get overlaid with that risk appetite we have in relation to dignity of risk. Mm. You know, it's 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 a very difficult situation for organisations to continue to navigate. Well, in terms and of that duty of care, uh, there has been some suggestion, and I'm not saying this represents it in any way, the views of the Royal Commission, that in disability services there should be a concept of a non-delegable duty of care, mm. similar to perhaps the common law duty of care that exists for educational institutions in relation to children. Mm. If there was a non-delegable duty of care, would, would the result be that the risk appetite would be less on any potential risk that might expose the organisation to liability? Would that be a consequence of a, I think a non-delegable duty I of care? I think it could be, yes. Can I come to, to you, Ms Berry, because I'm just looking at your risk appetite statement that you provided to the Royal Commission, and if the commissioners have got the hearing bundle, I don't know what, G, um, behind tab 23. Uh, are you familiar with this document? Again, I'm mindful that you've only come to the role recently. Is this um, approach to the risk appetite statement measures risk as zero, low, medium or high? Mm -hmm. And then it sets uh, a series of questions to work through to make uh, an assessment in relation to risk. And I think, Ms Tui, you've just referred to risk appetite statement. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that in the broader corporate world, ASIC is quite fond of risk appetite statements mm. and we see that language um, in other places. 
But Ms Berry, can you just walk us through how would this work? How would this risk appetite statement work in the scenarios that uh, we're exploring of dignity of risk and risk management? Mm. So you're in our risk appetite statement, um, we do articulate that in relation to client safety, our uh, approach to risk management, we, we have a low tolerance of, of risks in relation to client safety. Um, however, um, we will consider where there's scenarios where a dignity of risk is in play, um, our risk appetite goes up to medium. And the reason for that is that we want to enable people to uh, take risks where that's uh, their, their desire. Um, and as you know, my colleagues have mentioned, we individually assess uh, situations and apply our risk appetite to those situations um, in relation to the example that was provided before in regards to the individual client who wants to go to the beach, for example. Um, an important analysis of that situation would involve ensuring that the relevant staff member taking that person to the beach can swim. Um, so there's those individual assessments which are undertaken in advance of activities to make sure the person's supported. Doesn't That doesn't lend itself to much spontaneity. Spontaneity in life is before you say, it's a pretty hot day, I need to get down to Bondi. No, so it's going to go, here's the risk the management assessment <laughs> that we have to do. So how do you, again, dignity mm. of risk is also mm. the risk to be able to do something without necessarily thinking through everything and it might be spontaneous. How do you mm -hmm. how do you navigate that? I think part of that is around how you train your staff um, to enable people to take risks. Likewise, I think it's about your knowledge of the person that you're supporting and ensuring that you have a good knowledge um, of that person and their goals and their um, interests and ensuring that the supports that you put around that person enable that person to make those choices, I suppose, is the point that I was trying to make with that example. Um, yes. Uh, Ms Dean, in the material that you've provided to the Royal Commission, and Commissioners, this is in the same volume behind tab 27, you've provided to us a document called A Vain Report, Incidents of Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation, and it's got a number of graphs and figures that um, record the incidents. So is this a model that you use, coming back to our earlier discussion, to measure nature, <laughs> extent and causes? Yes, it's, um, we use this particular document in combination with a number of other documents um, and we look at them at a number of levels across the organisation. We look at it at the practice level and we also look at it at um, board level to be able to interrogate, evaluate and look at how we can actually reduce incidents um, and improve people's quality of life. So this particular VAME report would be looked at also at an operational level together with a raft of other incidents, restrictive practices and personal outcome measures. I want to now move to the interaction with the NDIS Commission. And the NDIS Commission says it uses a risk-based approach to regulation that is proportionate to the scale of the organisation and any breaches. And obviously, all organisations have got the reporting <coughs> obligations under the practice standards, the code of conduct. And um, to what extent <coughs> for each of your organisations has the reporting obligations on reportable incidents to the NDIS Commission change the way in which you think about risk in the organisation and how you also record incidents of risk. Is that something, Ms. Tui, you want to speak to? Yeah, I mean, I, look, I think, um, I think what it does is probably make organisations more risk averse. One of the things I was going to say in relation to dignity of risk is that it's actually not just about how an organisation manages particular, you know, risky activities or things that people want to be involved in. It's also about how our regulators respond to the outcomes that may occur as a result of that. So if every time you help someone go to the beach and go swimming, 
and someone does get into difficulties and the commission finds out it becomes a you know critical incident and then the you know you get a compliance notice and i mean that doesn't go a long way to actually helping organizations facilitate that whole sort of dignity of risk culture that you actually want in the organization mm -hmm. around service delivery so you know i think it's um and again it's that balance between duty of care and as a regulator how do they monitor to make sure organizations are doing the right thing but how are they also helping to enable that approach where someone with a disability can actually live the lives that they want to live as well. Well, I think you're all aware of the NDIS Commissioner's recent own motion report. Yeah. And that report at page 113 deals with preventing ongoing risk. And the report says it is apparent from examining the incidents and complaints included in this inquiry that incidents and issues reoccur and the practice of support workers does not necessarily adjust over time to avoid incidents and issues repeating. And uh, there seems to be in this report, and I'm paraphrasing, a frustration <laughs> that uh, there are uh, repetitions of matters and a, an apparent failure of providers to address the underlying cause of an incident or issue mm. so that it can continue to occur. And the report suggests that there is further work that needs to be done by providers to develop a culture of learning mm. that leads to the elimination or resolution of the factors that drive incidents and issues within the ability of the service provider to address. So you've seen that yes. aspect of it. Yeah. Um, do you sort of share the view of the Commission in yeah. terms of managing risk but managing the same risk over and over again. And yeah, so what, I do. what do you do about so, that? What's going so on if that's the case? So, I mean, one of the things we do in the organisation now is that our safeguarding team actually reviews all reportable incidents. Um, so they look at the type of incident that's occurring, the quality of the reporting that's going in, whether or not people have actually investigated as they need to. Um, so having that central oversight where you can mm -hmm. then get an organisational picture, I think when particularly for sort of, you know, larger organisations, I think that's incredibly important. Mm -hmm. It's very hard otherwise to see all the individual, um, you know, circumstances that may uh, arise. So I actually completely agree mm -hmm. with that. I think that's... And that's just part of your continuous improvement learning culture that you want. So, Ms Berry, your organisation, Disability Trust, was part of uh, the, the one of the organisations that participated in this own motion. Um, is there anything you want to say reflecting on the participation in this process with the NDIS Commissioner and that observation about addressing risks, not necessarily addressing the causes so that you have a repetition of the same things? Mm. So we welcomed the opportunity to be part of the own motion inquiry and found that a very beneficial experience in regards to the observations that the Commissioner made in relation to our service. Um, we, I, oh, I have a slightly different perspective perhaps to my colleague around the benefit of a reportable incident scheme because I do believe it, it sharpens the mind of the organisation when you see repeat incidents. Uh, and the need to lean in to attempt to prevent those incidents from occurring again. So I wholeheartedly agree with that observation. Mm -hmm. And Ms Dean, any sort of experiences from <laughs> your organisation's perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as well as what um, both my colleagues have said, I think it's it's a combination of the ability to, as, as you have said, lean into it, but also to have the systems and mechanisms to be able to deal with those repeats mm. and having the appropriate training and learning on hand um, to be able to um, look at the trends and then to be able to specifically design supports and learning to be able to work with those teams to understand what would be better practice. And some of those mechanisms going right back to the question before around understanding risk is understanding what each individual person that you're supporting wants to do to enjoy their life and having the mechanisms to do that through personal outcome measures. And then being able to have, for example, we have a 24-7 practice hotline that a support worker can call. Now, naturally, if they're on the beach, they're not going to pick up their phone while somebody could be... Um, unfortunately, um, drowning in the water, but that staff member could then pick up that phone and call just before they head out and have a conversation with an expert in that space to assist. And all those 
points of contact with our practice quality and safeguard team again enable us to look at trends so that we can then actually understand why we're getting potentially maybe repeats of particular behaviours that put people at risk. So my um, last questions that I want to ask you uh, are about working with the NDIS Commission into the future. The Commission has given its perspective on the service providers. Uh, have, from the service providers' perspective, have you had an opportunity to say to the NDIS Commission, this is what we think might need to improve at your end and how to make the system work better? So you're all nodding. <laughs> but um, what needs what needs to improve, if anything, to make this system uh, of safeguarding work even better? I, I have two points to make on that. First of all, one of the most important points in the Own Motion Inquiry report, in my view, was the fact that the Commission only, you know, in terms of the number of complaints that they considered, only 3% of those complaints came directly from people within supported accommodation. So to me, that speaks to the importance of us continuing to provide opportunities to empower people to speak up within services. Uh, the second point, which I think is important, is around the opportunity potentially for the NDIS Commission to create a repository of best practice examples um, from across the sector of documents, processes, et cetera, and potentially even the creation of some sort of best practice working group made up of service providers where we can work in collaboration with the Commission to continue to improve our practice. Is there any present repository of best practice examples? I know Professor Bigby has provided a best practice framework and on the literature review identified the sort of 10 or so elements that are critical to providing a safe environment. But mm. other than uh, some of the academic work, is there a repository of best practice? No, there, there is not one, I think, at the moment. And I, I think it's a really great opportunity um, for us to consider that. I know a, a previous panel member has suggested that as well. And I think it's a very good suggestion. Ms Dean? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, we're fortunate enough to work closely with um, Professor Big B and we're part of the longitudinal PCAS mm. um, research but and, and her cultural review survey mm. that we've done across our services. Um, but that's something that we see as um, an investment and it does come at a cost. And um, to be able to access that sort of information supports research through the NDIS and for the NDIS to take um, more of a learning and development approach together with a, a repository and the ability to access best practice um, would be highly valuable. Thank you. Ms Tui, any additional comments? Oh, look, only I think that there's a fine line that they walk in relation to whether or not they're actually our regulator or they are an organisation that, in fact, continues to help the sector learn and grow. Um, they're not so necessarily I, mutually inconsistent. They're objectives, not. Are they? They're not. But I. But I think. But I think, like in terms of you know communities of practice, um, you know best practice materials and things like that. Like we have a whole lot of resource out there. We actually also have a sector as well. Um, and uh, you know, I think that the commission. I mean, we've had a lot to do with the commission, as you would expect, uh, the last year or so. And um, and I think. Um, I think they also feel that tension a little bit uh, as well. I think you know they're also in a phase of of um, learning and changing and um, and growing. You know, I think if there's one thing I can uh, talk about in relation to the commission, it would actually to be operate operate as a national organisation, not state organisations. That would be a great benefit to the sector. All right. Thank thank you for that <laughs> um, right. I just contribution. Wanted to get that in. Um, <laughs> Commissioners, those are my questions. The commissioners may have some questions. Yes, for you. Thank you very much. Commissioner McKeown, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. I uh, thank you again uh, for your evidence. Uh, Ms. Berry, at the beginning of the panel, you said that you have to assume that there's always a high risk of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation in your service. Are you suggesting that your service is inherently a place of violence, and if you weren't, then what were you suggesting? No, I don't suggest our service is um, an inherent place of risk, but 
I think that as service providers, what we have learned in recent times, unfortunately, is that we can have individual staff members, for example, who can present significant risks to the people we support. We support people who uh, are highly vulnerable at times. Not everybody we support is highly vulnerable, but some of those people are. Um, they may not um, communicate with, with spoken language, for example, and so we need to be highly attuned um, to the fact that we may well um, have staff members who present a risk to those clients. And, and I do not think we can ever rest on our laurels on that front. I think, to be fair, uh, you were responding mm. to some questions that Ms Eastman asked, mm. which required you to make certain assumptions. Yeah. Carry on. Oh, that, thank you. Well, well Ms Berry, on that note then, are you suggesting that there are particular people out in the community who are attracted to working in your service because they think they can get away with it or they think they will be um, not disciplined or there'll be no penalties or any consequences. Is that what you're suggesting? I, in those comments, I don't think I'm talking about my service particularly. I think I'm talking in general about our sector. Um, are there individuals who seek to exploit vulnerable people in our community? Yes, I think there are a very small proportion of people that do do that and we need to be very sensitive to that, given that we have people who are quite vulnerable within our care. Thank you. Uh, one more question, uh, Ms Tui. Mm -hmm. uh, towards the end, you said that you felt in that all, um, service providers are becoming more risk averse because of the NDIS Quality and Safeguard Commission and, say, the example of swimming that mm -hmm. we discussed that it could become an incident report and then a compliant report. I suggest to you, would it not be to see the Commission role as an opportunity for service providers to be more accountable for how they might, as you described, let that person live their best life, yeah. including going swimming? Yeah, I do you have a response? Do you want no, to respond I can, to that? I can, I, can, I completely agree with that. I completely agree with that. I think... I. I think that the Commission, to a great extent, in terms of its, you know, inception and where it sort of currently sits now, I think it is a regulator. Like it's, <laughs> but I do think it probably has a role to play in exactly as you're describing. Uh, well, thank you again, all of you. I appreciate your contributions. Commissioner Bennett. Um, um, Ms Dean, there was a conversation between uh, you and Ms Eastman about the in the context of peer-on-peer -peer violence clients. And Ms Eastman referred to a conversation that we had, I think, with um, David Panter about reviewing their housing stock. Um, and it was a general conversation to say, people exercising choice and control, there was definitely a move to smaller housing. Is that what your organisation is doing in your housing stock to single or maybe two people type dwellings? We're actually um, one of the providers that receive government services, which were the group homes. And that is something that we are absolutely working towards any of the new um, homes that are being provided. And we're actually a SIL provider, so a provider of the, support, it's of the supports, not necessarily the SDA, the Specialist Disability Accommodation, but we work together with the SDA provider to look at much smaller accommodations. So, in fact, we have had one um, very recent development with a whereby we've worked with an SDA provider to build um, townhouses so that individuals can live on their own or they can live with a friend. So not even looking at three together, but people being able to live by themselves or with somebody else. Um, and it may be with two units on the one side or three units on the one side, whereby the staff are located in another unit and through the use of technology, um, those people can live independently, even people with very high complex support needs. And those units are in normal streets, not clustered? No, absolutely in normal streets, yes. Um, and I know you're saying you're looking at it, but you have some already. Has it reduced the the peer-on-peer -peer violence? 
I would have to speak anecdotally because I don't have any documentation in front of me, but yes. So um, we do have quite a few um, homes that actually um, represent those sorts of environments. So there'll be apartments, um, townhouses, and um, absolutely individuals who have displayed behaviours of protest when they've lived with others now have had the opportunity to live on their own or live with somebody else that they've chosen to live with and that is absolutely reduced. Just a few more questions. Sure. It may not necessarily be a person with disability that they choose to live with, is that right? Um, we've not had that experience, but that can be the case, absolutely. And how does, what protections do you put in then to make sure that there's not an in, a greater risk from your staff that go in there? Is it a rotation of staff so it's not just one member of staff seeing one person all the time? Or No, absolutely. It can be a team of staff and um, they would then rotate. But then... Um, more often than not, the person living in the apartment may choose a number of staff that they want to support them. Um, but we've certainly learned from the experiences previously um, in terms of having one staff member only provide support. And we know the risks involved in that. And we don't have actually any situations where that's the case. And do you have a governance management where maybe a team leader goes to visit and see how things are going, not just leaving it? Absolutely. One of our approaches, um, and it is part of our approach to um, a human rights framework is, and we just call that presence. So it's expected that team leaders, so in those particular environments, there are actually a team leader, there is a team leader on site that will work in the staff unit, which is separate to the others. And we also expect managers at all levels to visit homes to have presence, um, including myself. Can I ask the other members, are you thinking of those options, um, given that information that's just been provided? Yes. So where we have individuals that we support who have a single worker who provides the majority of their supports, we do have mechanisms to ensure that there's checking in with that person independently of just that individual support worker um, because we have learned through previous experiences um, that it's it not personally, but the sector, um, I think we've, we've all had impressed upon us those risks around single worker yeah. environments and the safeguards that we need to build in. And yeah. a move away from those larger group home arrangements? Yes. If that's the intent. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to uh, each of you, Ms. Dean, Ms. Berry and Ms. Tui. Ms. Tui, thank you for uh, participating in three sessions. You may regard yourself as released <laughs> for the day. Thank you. Uh, we will uh, now, I think, um, adjourn for a short we while have a or are we very, going straight into the next session? A very brief adjournment just to do a okay. well, small reconstitution. Thank you very thank much. You. Your contributions you. have been very helpful. Thank you. The, the Royal Commission is now adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, Ms. Nelson. Thank you, Chair. The next witness this afternoon is Ms. Laurie Lee from the National Disability Services. Has Ms. Lee taken the oath or affirmation, as the case may be? Uh, your associate. Not yet. I have not. Is going to. All right. Yeah. Ms. Lee, thank you very much for coming to the Commission and uh, giving evidence uh, today. We appreciate your assistance. If you would be good enough to follow the instructions of my associate, she will administer the affirmation to you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you very much. I'll now ask Ms. Dowser to ask you some questions. Thank you. Ms. Lee, you are the CEO of National Disability Services. Yes. And we can refer to that as NDS. Yes. You've been in that role since the 12th of January 2022? As the permanent CEO, yes. 
Correct. Your professional background is as a registered mental health nurse. Yes. And you appeared as a witness in public hearing 22 with your colleague, Kerry Langford. Yes. I'm going to turn now to NDS and just go quickly through some background material. Please um, correct me if I get anything incorrect. So NDS is a peak body for non-government disability service organisations throughout Australia. Yes. At, in your 2022 annual report, you say you have more than 1,200 members. That's right. And they include not-for-profit disability service providers, for-profit disability service providers, sole traders and government agencies. Yes, that's right. And among those members, you do have members who are on digital platforms. Yes. In addition to your members, NDS has the National Disability Practitioner Network. Yes. And there are 16,000 people on that network. Yes, that's right. And these are the disability support workers themselves. That's right. And NDS provides resources to that group. Yes. In terms of membership, you're made up of from sole traders to entities with more than 1,000 people in their organisation. Yes. And revenue of less than a million dollars, which is described as very small, up to uh, members who earn more, have more than $20 million in revenue, which is large. That's right. And, but in that spread, one third of your membership have an annual revenue of under $650,000. That's right, yes. And you have members in all states and territories of Australia. Yes. NDS members provide disability services across a spectrum, including housing and accommodation. Um, you do assistance in in-house, so personal care, daily life tasks, household tasks. Yes, that's right. Um, and just skipping through, support coordination plan management. Yes. You do um, home and vehicle modification. Yes. And a whole other spectrum. The range. And your members include people who are or members who are registered NDS, NDIS providers and people who aren't registered. That's right. NDS produces an annual document called the State of the Disability Sector Report. Yes. Commissioners, you have the 2022 version of that report in bundle L at tab 9. This report is a snapshot of where the sector is in a particular year. That's right. And it is drawn, it draws on the results of your annual market survey, which is conducted by the Centre for Disability Research and Policy at the University of Sydney. That's right. And we see in the 2022 report that on this occasion, the annual survey received 364 responses. Yes. Are you able to comment on whether the consistency of the outcomes of the market survey, are, whether that's consistent with what you're hearing from your members through other means? Uh, yes, that's absolutely consistent. We have a number of other forums that we meet with our members, um, either individually or through uh, communities of practice or through network forums or workshops. Uh, and uh, we regularly poll them on these kind of issues and uh, the sector of the dis state of the disability sector report, sorry, is uh, absolutely congruent with those other means. So you're confident in the results of that survey, notwithstanding the small sample size relative to your overall membership? Yes, uh, part of the analysis of the data of the survey was a confidence interval and uh, the data is sufficient to have a good level of confidence across the sector. Thank you. Against that background, I'd like now to turn to a couple of NDS products that have been referred to in evidence in this hearing, but also in other hearings of this Royal Commission. And the first is your product, or NDS's product, Human Rights and You. And Commissioners, you have a, a copy of the workbook from this in the materials, but I, I won't take you to it. We'll just talk about what it is. This is a, a video-based e-learning program. That's right. And it is targeted to disability support workers, families and practitioners. Yes. The video is supported by a workbook. Yes. And the video 
takes 30 minutes to play, is that including time to complete the workbook? Uh, no, um, that's uh, the time to complete the workbook is in addition to that, uh, and there are a number of modules within that 30-minute uh, um, video. How many modules? Uh, four. And so how much time in addition to the 30 minutes does it take to complete the workbook? Um, I think on the um, overview of the whole piece, we think about something <coughs> between 60 and 80 minutes. Right. So service providers who've told this Royal Commission that they use that product as their human rights training, we're talking about up to 80 minutes of training to do that. And the, the product is free. It's just available online? Yes, freely available to anybody on our website. And as I understand from the workbook, this product was developed by NDS in collaboration with a number of entities, including uh, people with disability. Absolutely. Um, so we worked together with the Victorian Advocacy League uh, for Individuals with Disability, VALID. Um, we worked together with a group called Beyond Edge, which is a theatrical group which include um, uh, all crew and uh, actors uh, being people with disability. We also work together with the Disability Advocacy Resource Unit um, and in addition with our own lived experience network who are uh, employees of ours who have uh, disability and are skilled facilitators and educators. Has NDS undertaken any evaluation of this product? If you've spent the 80 minutes watching the video and working through the workbook, do you achieve the result that NDS was hoping for? Yes, yeah, so all of our uh, training and education has uh, competency-based assessments at the end of the e-learning so that people will need to answer questions and answer them correctly in order to be able to complete uh, the training. Um, and in addition, we have a, a usual satisfaction type survey as well. Right. Why did NDS develop this product? Um, I think uh, before my time at NDS, but uh, understanding from my team uh, that um, it was the um, the importance of human rights uh, within the disability sector was you know, clearly there, um, and an understanding that particularly for disability support workers and for some of our smaller members, uh, those who haven't got the resources to have a learning and development team or a learning and development manager. Um, being able to make sure there was really easily accessible information and uh, training on human rights was going to be important. And so we had a grant uh, from Victoria and the department in uh, WA that enabled us to uh, develop this training. And since it was developed, has it been reviewed and updated? Yes, uh, we review it quite regularly, although I'm not sure exactly when this one was. I know the zero tolerance ones have just been updated. And we're just about to turn to those, the Zero Tolerance Initiative. So I understand from the website that this was led by NDS in partnership with the disability sector to understand, implement and improve practices which safeguard the rights of people they support. Yes, that's what right. What does that mean? Uh, so... Um, as we've heard uh, many times in the testament in this hearing, uh, the importance of really being able to educate and train and develop uh, the disability workforce uh, to understanding uh, what violence, abuse, aggress aggression, and sorry, violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation are, um, and how to respond to them, uh, how to effectively uh, report, um, and what needs to be said. So, um, for example, in our zero tolerance resources, uh, again, they're all very accessible. We've used our own lived experience network uh, facilitators to develop um, the films for this, so they're easy to understand. They um, drill into and, and give examples of um, day-to-day -day practice for disability support workers, the things that they might see, the things that they might hear, the situations that they might need to, to, to run through. Uh, and there are a number of, of modules throughout that course which hopefully will um, uh, give disability support workers a really good understanding of their role and their expectations around um, zero tolerance for so I'd just like to back up a little bit and Sorry. talk a, a little bit more about what the Zero Tolerance Initiative comprises. So as I understand it, there is a framework, which is a, a two-page document that lays out an overview of what you try, what the initiative is seeking to achieve. Yes. 
And then underneath that, there is the zero tolerance um, presentation and facilitator guide. Yes. So that, as I understand it, is aimed at um, if, I, if I'm in a service provider, I use the facilitator guide, I, I watch and work out how to do it, and then I deliver it to my people. Is that, if That's I understood right, that yes. correctly? That's and the facilitator, the presentation and facilitator guide takes 15 to 20 minutes to complete. Uh, yes. And then sitting underneath that are the resources that you just mentioned. And it's a collection of more than 150 online resources. That's right. Some of those are videos. Yep. And some of them are workbooks and worksheets. Workbooks, worksheets, um, pieces for reflective practice uh, for individuals, uh, but also uh, templates and examples uh, that organisations can then take and amend uh, for their own context use them and use themselves. You were present in the hearing room a moment ago for the previous panel. Yes. And so you would have heard Ms Dean reflecting on the need for there to be a repository of best practice and she, she was speaking about the NDIS Commission and whether it could be the repository. Do you regard that as a function that perhaps NDS is already doing or could do? Um, so there are certainly places that we uh, do provide that, zero tolerance being uh, one of those uh, that we've pulled up. We also provide um, communities of practice uh, where we uh, bring together uh, providers in various different uh, specialities, whether it's uh, rural or remote or uh, working with younger people um, to share good practice. Um, we have in the past uh, had a repository of uh, uh, example um, policies and procedures of best practice that providers could take and use. Uh, we found that very expensive to keep uh, uh, updated as regularly as it needed to be. Just returning to the Zero Tolerance Initiative, I understand, from your website, we know that the resources hub for the initiative has been visited more than 108,000 times since it was launched in 2013. Yes. Has NDIS examined how its members use that resource, whether, they, they, whether support workers are using it on, in paid time with facilitated sessions? Are they required to watch it in their own time? Have you done any of that work? Um, that's, that's not data that we collect specifically about whether um, support workers are doing the education in their own time or uh, paid by providers. We do know that um, around 800, or slightly over 800 uh, providers have specifically used our resources. So we would assume that that would be within their time um, and that it's been um, completed over 19,000 times in this last 12 months uh, by disability support worker providers, uh, sorry, disability support workers. Whether that means it's within their own time or not, we don't have the data on that, I'm afraid. Is that something you could ask your members? Uh, we could ask. Uh, do, does NDS have a view about how this resource is best used? Is it intended to, to be done on your own in your own time or is it intended to be done as a, a learning in the workplace? Um, I think it's uh, intended to be flexible enough to use across the very multiple uh, varieties of workplaces that you find within the disability sector. So uh, as we talked about earlier, our membership uh, is very variable from very large to extremely small. Uh, and so providing the resources in ways that people can use that is uh, helpful for them, whatever their organisational context, I think uh, that's, that was the aim of having all the different uh, parts to it. As with the human rights training, the Zero Tolerance Initiative is available online for free. Yes. But members can also purchase it and have it hosted in their own training, learning and development programs. That's right, yes. And we can also deliver it as an uh, in-house workshop if needed. How often do you deliver it as an in-house workshop? Uh, because that costs a little more money than the, uh, the free versions that are online. I think uh, in the last year or so, there has been... Uh, only one in-house booking for us. Is there any difference between the free version and the version members can purchase? Uh, no, 
Uh, it's it's available. It's, it depends. Some larger organisations who have their own uh, learning management systems might want to host that on their own systems. Uh, smaller places might want to access it directly from us. In some evidence earlier this week, um, speaking on the, the Human Rights Panel, Ms Dean said that, um, speaking of her organisation, had a zero tolerance approach to any breach of human rights. The way that would work practically is if there is a breach and it's committed by a support worker, for example, there would be an immediate action and that would be a stand down and probably result in a termination. Firstly, does that evidence describe how the Zero Tolerance Initiative operates in practice? Um, so I guess that is an example of what would happen if there were an incident, whereas the Zero Tolerance Initiative really talks around the entire framework uh, for an organisation. So uh, it goes from uh, helping people to understand what uh, abuse might look like. Um, it uh, talks through uh, the development of a positive culture, one where... Um, disability support workers feel free and enabled to speak up. Uh, it talks around um, recognising uh, uh, what restrictive practices are. Uh, it uh, goes us through um, trauma-informed support, uh, positive behaviour support. So um, the zero tolerance framework is much wider than the individual response to an incident, but that is also included in there. So it really does have that capacity and culture building element to it. Absolutely. Within the zero tolerance framework, where does institutional accountability sit? Is there part of the framework that deals with that? Yeah, so the, within the uh, framework, we have a um, uh, part that's significantly around uh, human rights. Uh, and we also pull that out for um, particularly around uh, boards and board governance and um, that more institutional approach to it. Um, so... Uh, both within the zero tolerance resources, but also with some of our resources that were also referenced earlier, um, which we work in partnership with uh, Purpose at Work, the Right on Board program, uh, that um, uh, uh, embeds a zero tolerance approach and those that type of framework uh, at a board level um, for that institutional responsibility. I take it you would accept that a, a zero tolerance approach, which was simply if, if there's a report, then the individual support worker is stood down and terminated and that's the end of the story. There's, there's no more problem from that person because they're not here anymore. That's not what the, the approach that's intended? Uh, no, I mean, that, that might be the outcome if an individual support worker has uh, significantly breached uh, someone's human rights and, and acted outside of the policies of the organisation. Uh, but that, as I said, the, the framework, the zero um, tolerance framework is much wider than that. Uh, and I think it's really important that uh, those type of responses and the, the zero tolerance um, approach is bedded into that uh, culture, uh, the learning and development, uh, the positive behaviour support, all of those pieces that go around mm -hmm. making sure or hoping to make sure that uh, incidents or complaints are reduced and, and eliminated. Ms. Dowsett, I'm not sure whether you're assuming that if there's a breach of human rights, regardless of its gravity, that the result necessarily will be termination. Is that what you were intending to assume? Uh, in the hypothetical I just put then, yes, I was intending to but put you, that. You're not suggesting that any such contravention would necessarily result in termination, are you? I, I'm not suggesting that it should, and I think that that would be inappropriate. But uh, Yes, no, I just want to make sure we're on common ground at all. Ms Lee, have you read the NDIS Commission own motion inquiry report that we've spoken about a number of times in this hearing? Yes, I have. Has NDS released anything on that report to its members? Uh, so um, shortly after that report was released, I think within the first 48 hours, we released a, an analysis of that report to our members. Um, going through some of the key themes that were found in the report and also um, some of the uh, recommendations for our members to have a look at proactively uh, in terms of their practice. Um, a bit of a heads up about what we think the Commission might do in terms of the recommendations they made around a practice standard, around additional regulation. 
Uh, so, yes, that part of our role as a peak is to make sure our members are informed about uh, key findings for reports like that. And what's the next step for, for the organisation as a peak? So you've informed them, and then what do you do? Um, so there are some specific things coming out of that report, particularly around um, active support, practice leadership, um, a, a practice standard uh, for um, supported independent living. Uh, and so uh, part of what we are now working on um, is uh, looking at developing some resources in that um, practice leadership, um, active support space uh, that will be accessible to our members. Um, and uh, we are hoping to engage with the NDIS Commission on the development of the practice standard so that uh, it can be uh, informed by uh, provider experiences as well. One of the matters touched on in the own motion report, which, which he didn't speak of then, was the, the observation in relation to service agreements. And the, the own motion report says at page, page 61, many complaints would be avoided if there was clearer communication with a person with disability and or their supporters and if service agreements were clearer and presented in a form that was accessible to the person with disability and their supporters. Does NDS issue any guidance or best practice advice to its members, firstly, on the use of service agreements? Uh, yes, uh, we have an example service agreement of, of a high-level template which is accessible to our members um, for them to take and use, which goes through uh, some of the things that we think are uh, important in, in uh, service agreements like how to make a complaint and what level of service uh, people might expect and when, how responsive uh, providers might be to uh, requests or change. Uh, I think there's a number of uh, different points, there's about 20 different aspects that we cover in that sample um, service agreement. Does the guidance provided by NDS deal with the fact that other than for SDA, service agreements are not required to be in writing? Um, our guidance is that we think it is good practice to, um, uh, to have service agreements because it does really clearly set out um, the contract that a provider has with its participant, with the participants. Um, it isn't mandatory and, and we can't make it mandatory. Um, and I think there are a variety of circumstances. Um, we've heard uh, previously about um, people who have been moved from uh, state-based supported independent living uh, to a provider where uh, perhaps uh, their experience of uh, making their own agreements or their family or, or uh, advocates experience of making their own agreements has not been there previously and through that moving pro process potentially is not there either. Um, whereas uh, there may be uh, members of ours, for example, who are um, bringing new participants into different services, day services or community engagement who would, as a standard, have a service agreement. If the purpose of the service agreement is to provide that clarity of expectation about what the services are going to be, would a best practice model see that detail, what the service is, when it will be provided and who is going to provide it, would, would you see that in the agreement rather than in a document that's developed later after the agreement's entered into? I think it's difficult to say that uh, on the basis of the the, the difference in uh, the types of services and the circumstances across the sector at the moment. Um, as I said, there might be circumstances where somebody has been in a service for many, many years um, and, so, and hasn't had the opportunity for a service agreement to be developed through that. Uh, and there may be on the other side, you know, uh, great examples of practice where service agreements are uh, down to that level. Uh, you mentioned in there in terms of details who is going to be providing the service. And again, I think that's difficult depending on the type of service. So if you had uh, a one-on-one -on -one service or, uh, for example, perhaps um, um, uh, a support coordinator type service with an individual where um, 
you know, that support coordinator was there to find out and support and uh, assist that individual, then you might specify the who. Uh, whereas if it's uh, a service where you might have more people coming in and out or a shared support um, across a number of different people with disability, it might be difficult to say, well, it'll be provided by Mick today. Turning to a couple of other topics, because I need, need to keep this moving, I, I would like now to turn to advocates and community visitors. Do, does NDS have a policy or does it provide best practice guidance to its members on how to engage with advocates and community visitors, firstly in a proactive approach, so reaching out to them or supporting the people they support to access those services? Um, NDS's policy is that we absolutely um, support uh, people with disability to have access to advocates. So I think that that is a clear, clear and important part of service provision. Um, what we can say strongly is that there are insufficient advocates within the system. Uh, so part of the data within our state of the sector report is we ask uh, members around uh, their ability to uh, get uh, advocates in uh, to support people when they need it. Uh, and only 14% of our members said that there was sufficient advocacy available. Uh, so that goes to both at an individual level, uh, the ability for individuals to have advocates that will help uh, them to uh, find the right services, but also at a systemic level. Um, so. Uh, Within the individual NDIS packages, I have many examples of providers who have wanted uh, an advocate to assist or to step in, who have worked with the family or uh, the decision makers uh, or the person with uh, disability themselves to request that advocacy goes into an NDIS package. And uh, I have not seen one yet <laughs> that has come back with that. Uh, so from an individual perspective, the funding for advocacy is not uh, coming through the system, but uh, from a, a system-wide perspective, uh, many advocacy organisations, as you would have heard earlier this week, uh, have no consistent source of funding either, um, and, and I think that is a risk for the system. Related topic, does NDS have a policy or provide best practice guidance to its members on how to build and embed supported decision make supported decision making into its practice model uh, yes in fact we have uh, quite a few resources on supported decision making again uh, because we feel that it is a really important part of um, uh, good practice as far as service provision goes um, and so we absolutely support the move from uh, previous regimes of substitute decision making into supported decision making. Um, we have uh, an e-learning module around this, uh, which has had uh, over 3,000 uh, uh, completions in this last uh, 12 months. Um, we have guides for providers around um, supported decision making and the NDIS and how to do that. Uh, we have uh, in-house workshops um, and we also include on our the Right on Board product uh, um, supported decision making. Um, Having said that, we also believe strongly that um, supported decision making is something that takes time, it takes expertise, it takes skilled professional staff uh, who have had training in that. And I think as we've heard at the beginning of this week, all of those are in very short supply. Is there something that NDS uh, can do or is doing to uh, to try and respond to that issue of short supply that you're talking about? Uh, regular discussions with the NDIA about the uh, disability support worker cost model and its inadequacy uh, in terms of helping providers to deliver high quality services. Uh, next topic, workforce. So in her opening on Monday, Ms Eastman quoted from your State of the Disability Sector report in which workforce issues were described as going from bad to worse. Yes. In NDS's annual report for 2022, there's an estimate, an estimated additional 83,000 workers will be required by 2025 for a skilled, competent and engaged workforce to ensure people with disability can receive high quality services and supports. Firstly, where does the number come from? Uh, that was um, the number that was in the um, oh, it was a government document. Document. It was the um, disability sector. Um, 
uh, workforce strategy. So it's not yeah. an NDS number. It's, a, it's a not an NDS estimate. number. And can I uh, just add to that uh, 33,000? That is the number of new workers uh, because of the growth of the NDIS and the growth of uh, service provision within the NDIS. We have heard over this last week about the extraordinary turnover within the sector. So when you add those figures in there, uh, which are uh, over 200,000, in the next couple of years, we are going to need an extra 300,000 workers in order to be able to provide high quality services uh, to people with disability <laughs> under the scheme. It is an enormous challenge. Is there a particular occupational group within the sector where there is a most urgent need or is the need spread across the sector? Um, so what we've seen in this last 12 months and the change from the survey 12 months ago to the one, this latest one, is that um, the workforce need has spread uh, beyond its sort of traditional areas of need into even back of house workforce like uh, finance teams and HR teams and quality teams. Um, 60% uh, of providers say they find it very difficult to recruit disability support workers. Uh, sorry, that it was 60%, and now it's up around 80%. Um, but the key group, I think, that um, disability service providers are saying they find it almost impossible to get are allied health, so therapists, speech pathologists, occupational therapists, um, uh, psychologists, uh, and the figures for there are, um, in this last 12 months, in this last report, 96, 97% of providers saying they cannot get uh, workers in allied health sufficient to meet the demand for those services. The next topic I'd like to move to is career pathway for disability support workers. Did you hear Dr Panter's evidence earlier this week? I must admit I missed the last bit of his evidence, I'm afraid. So what he said, and this is page 173 of the transcript, there should be a career pathway. We are a big sector and you can't necessarily accommodate in one organisation all of somebody's particular needs as they are moving through that pathway. Nationally, we need to have more work done on establishing what those career pathways are. We don't have some of the syst systemic elements in place to enable that to happen. We have quite a lot currently working against people having those career pathways. He's talking about there is a need, needs to be sector-wide rather than organisational. Does NDS have a perspective on what could be done to develop a career pathway for disability support workers? Um, yes. <laughs> Uh, so a very complex uh, question, that one, with a lot of moving parts to it. Um, and, I, and I think probably there's some context that should be provided uh, as well around that. Uh, we heard from, I think, um, uh, Dr. McDonald uh, earlier about the uh, older workforce that we have in the disability sector as well. And many of the disability support workers uh, within the sector are... Um, you know, not looking to progress to management. Uh, I think our, one of our uh, evidence from our witness before was that they, they don't want to progress to management. Um, uh, they like being a disability support worker, albeit uh, it would be good to build up skills uh, around that. Um, in terms of the career pathway, um, absolutely, we think that that should be uh, better defined, that there should be uh, clearer pathways for people, not just to do that traditional, you know, uh, become a house manager, become a team leader, become a regional manager, become a CEO, um, but also uh, in terms of um, developing their own practice. So, for example, uh, if somebody is really interested in working with people uh, with uh, different types of behaviour, being able to see their development into a behaviour support practitioner and how that, that works. Um, there are so many areas of need within the workforce uh, side of the disability sector that there are opportunities, but again, they aren't necessarily well defined at the moment. The final topic that I want to address with you this afternoon ha has multiple parts, but it's registration. So we, we've dealt with NDIS registration and the fact that some of your members are registered and some aren't. Are you able to say... Um, what, what factors your members tell you drive their decision to register or not? Leaving aside those for whom registration is mandatory, just when it's a choice. Uh, thank you. And there are only a small section of people for whom registration is mandatory. Yes. But uh, there is a significant group of uh, providers within the sector who 
choose to be registered. Um, some of that is uh, 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 from organizations who have always been registered, who, who are older uh, not-for-profits who have always been in the sector, and their registration is part of their demonstration of quality and the systems that they have behind that. Some of that is driven by the um, uh, classifications of people within the NDIA, um, so uh, if you are providing support to people who remain uh, agency managed, then you have to be a registered provider. Um, there is an increasing group of people who are um, self-managed or plan managed, and for those people you do not have to be a registered provider, even if you are providing higher levels of um, risky services, for example, supported independent living or personal care, um, so you can be unregistered uh, regardless for those. Um, there is a live conversation within the disability um, service provider sector at the moment about what is the point in registration. So if, if I'm a provider who has uh, many uh, participants who are self-managed or um, uh, plan-managed, what is the point in being registered? Uh, because it costs more money, uh, you have to do a lot more reporting, you have a lot more systems in place in terms of worker screening that you would, than you would otherwise have. Um, and they see very clearly that uh, many other providers uh, doing the same sort of work are not being registered. And so uh, what is the need for them to take on that registration, especially when it comes with all of those additional costs, uh, but no additional funding? And so other than the marker of quality that you spoke about earlier, what is the benefit for firstly providers and then secondly for users of registration? Uh, so I, uh, not running a provider anymore, don't need to go through the, uh, the pain of the uh, certification system uh, that it is. Uh, but in terms of the benefit, I think, for the sector, people with uh, disability and providers, um, having a set of standards to work to that clearly enunciate uh, complaint systems, uh, incident management systems, uh, governance, uh, practice standards that you need to meet, I think is really important at raising that level of quality uh, of the services. Um, in addition, there are some things that um, uh, registered providers need to um, provide, which I think are a basic level of safety that should be there across the whole disability sector, registered or not registered. And in particular, I'm thinking about worker screening there uh, for non-registered providers. Uh, there are no... Um, uh, even basic screening requirements for their workers. So somebody could have, uh, you know, murdered somebody uh, and be convicted for that and still work as a disability support worker the next day. Of your members who are in Victoria, are you aware of any who are encouraging their workers to register under the Victorian scheme? Um, I am not aware of that, no, that uh, there are providers uh, recommending that. And finally, on this of the final topics, does NDS have a view about the, the benefits or otherwise of national mandatory registration? Um, so I think uh, uh, my absolute, our absolute preference would be for national registration rather than a piecemeal state-by-state -state approach, uh, because I think uh, that that um, leads to additional um, processes for some providers that are not there for others. Uh, it's not clear for people with disability uh, what um, the providers that they are approaching, what requirements they have and, and how they should be meeting them. Um, so uh, if we are going to have a registration scheme, absolutely it should be national and not uh, piecemeal by state or territory. Um, I think uh, that the worker screening piece is absolutely essential. Um, uh, but our learning from the work screening process as it is at the moment is that it can at times be uh, difficult, uh, it can take time, you can lose valuable workers uh, because their screening has taken too long and actually they can start tomorrow. Is your IGA. preference uh, in relation to providers within the NDIS or a national scheme for any service provider to people with disabilities? I think anyone looking after somebody or providing support for somebody with a disability should, as a basic minimum, have a screening and a registration scheme that works well and is not a burden would be um, a good way of doing it. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms Lee. Those are my questions. The, the, the commissioners may have some more for you. Um, very quickly, I understand you've got about 120 employees, right? Uh, yes, fluctuates you, a bit. But How many employees do you have with a disability? Um, we have... 17% uh, of those with a disability, so 20... 17%. And are any of the directors on your board people with disability? The question that we ask our directors is not uh, that. It's uh, whether they have a connection, a personal connection with disability. And out of the 13 directors that we have on our board, five have answered yes to that. Um, it is something that... Um, we are looking at uh, in terms of the additional um, opportunity for appointed directors now, which until very recently we didn't have, uh, to be able to recognise in our skills matrix and potentially rec recruit in that area. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Ms Lee, you talked about uh, at length about the e-learning modules that you have. Are you able to point to or provide any data or other information that demonstrate the effectiveness of, say, for example, the human rights training that you talked about. I don't want to simplify it, but if, can you say, for example, service provider X provided the training to their staff and then there was a reduction in violence, abuse, neglect. Now, I know I'm oversimplifying it, but I'm really looking for effectiveness of the training. Can you point to anything? Uh, so, no, unfortunately, that wouldn't be data that we would have access to in terms of our members. Um, uh, what we do do is a competency-based framework, so we're able to say at the end of the training, uh, this individual who has completed the training has a good understanding and has answered uh, sufficient questions correctly. Uh, uh, and thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lee, for coming to the Commission. Thank you for your evidence this afternoon. Uh, it uh, has been uh, interesting and helpful. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Dowsett, what is to happen now? Uh, if, if it please, Chair, I would call Mr. Jess Harper, who is in the room, so we'll just do a, a quick swap over and press right. on. All right. Well, in that case, we shall stay where we are. Ms. Harper would be good enough to come forward. Or was it Mr. Harper? Mr. Harper. I'm sorry, Mr. Harper. We shall do a lightning switch. Has Mr. Harper been sworn or affirmed, as the case may be? He has not. Mr. Harper, thank you very much for coming to the Commission. If you would be good enough to follow the instructions of my associate, who is seated opposite you, she will administer the affirmation to you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Mr Harper. I'll ask Ms Dowsett now to uh, ask you some questions. Thank you. Mr Harper, you are the CEO of Disability Intermediaries Australia. Yes. And you've held that role since November 2019. Yes. You are also a member of the NDIS Quality and Safeguard Commission's Industry Consultative Committee. Yes. And you are a member of the NDIA's Industry CEO Reference Group. Yes. And you are an Executive Committee member of the NDIA's digital community of interest. Correct. But you are here speaking to us today in your capacity with Disability Intermediaries Australia. Yes. And I can call that DIA. Yes. You have prepared a statement for this Royal Commission. Yes. And there are two minor corrections to that statement. That's correct. Uh, commissioners, this is in bundle A at tab 21. The first correction is at paragraph 64. There is a remnant footnote number six that doesn't have a any text, it should be omitted. Correct. And in paragraph 78, the cross-reference should be to paragraph 77. That's correct. With those two corrections, are the contents of the statement true and correct? Yes, they are. Thank you. So DIA is the peak body for plan management and support coordination providers and practitioners. That's correct. You have 900 provider members and 35,000 practitioner members. Yes. And they deliver intermediary supports, so plan management or support coordination, to over 255 NDIS 
NDIS participants? Uh, 255,000 NDIS participants, yes. Very briefly about plan management and support coordination, just for people who are not as familiar as you with those terms. A participant chooses how the funds in their plan are administered or managed. There are three options and a participant can choose between the three or a combination of the three. That's correct. There is agency managed and according to some NDIA statistics from the 2022-23 quarter one report, 13% of all NDIS, NDIS participants are agency managed. That's correct. Then there is self-managed and plan-managed. That's correct. And self-managed and plan-managed, people can choose a combination of those. That's correct. Plan-managed, we have 57%. That's correct. And the balance are either partially or fully self-managed. That's correct. Plan management is financial administration, and that's funded separately to reasonable and necessary supports. That's correct. There's another component to it, which is capacity building, of supporting a participant to be able to manage their own plan in the future, and that's funded through reasonable and necessary supports. Yes. And so then plan managers, picking up on Ms Lee's evidence before, plan managers need to be registered NDIS providers. That's correct, under the legislation. Yes. And then support coordination. Uh, do not need to be registered. No. So there are three levels of okay. support coordination. And you must be registered if you are delivering support coordination to a participant who is agency managed. That is correct or if you are providing level three specialist support coordination. Correct. And you've spoken in your statement about the vital role of these intermediaries, plan managers and support coordination in terms of enabling choice and control for participants. Yes. If I could just ask you to stick with support coordination, can you just very briefly talk about how that, how the process of the person providing support coordination enables choice and control? Support coordinators across all three levels um, by their function are there to support a participant to um, uh, be informed consumers um, and to understand um, and unpack their plan and what opportunities uh, their NDIS plan or package is able to then be um, uh, be procured. They'll work with a participant to um, engage and connect um, with service providers um, and ultimately are there to support a participant to, um, as much as possible, self-direct their service. Um, so they're there to support a participant and to uh, allow a participant to exercise their voice as much as possible. So it's more than just providing a list of phone numbers of people who might do what you want. Correct. It's it's working with a participant to understand their specific needs, requirements, preferences, um, and then um, working with that participant to find the most appropriate providers to deliver that support. And DIA is doing some work on what I might refer to briefly as professionalising intermediary support. So you've developed professional standards of practice. That's correct. And you've provided copies of those to the Royal Commission. I have. And you're also working on an accreditation model. That's correct. And this work is done in consultation with service users, people with disability. That's correct. Uh, with your members. That's correct. And also with the NDIA and NDIS Commission. That's correct. I want to turn now to a specific topic that is addressed in both of the professional standards of practice, but I'll refer to it in the context of support coordination. And this is the, the issue of conflict of interest. And so the, the question that has arisen in a number of hearings in this Royal Commission, and one which you address in your statement, is the, the potential for, or the actual, conflict of interest when a participant's support coordinator works for the same provider as from whom they get other services. 
So can you explain Disability Intermediaries Australia's view about that conflict of interest issue? Absolutely. From um, a professionalisation perspective, and, and as you mentioned in our professional standards of practice, DIA takes a view that um, if you're going to operate as a, an intermediary, so be that plan management or support coordination, you shouldn't be able to be the same provider to the same participant for other supports and services. And the reason for that, and we've heard some um, very telling uh, evidence throughout these hearings um, uh, and some themes around... Um, um, uh, coercive control, uh, power and influence. And what we have found um, prior to uh, implementing our professional standards of practice was the number of um, organisations who um, are multifaceted, provide lots of different types of supports and services, using support coordination as a client capture mechanism. Um, it's extremely difficult for a support coordinator to be able to um, question and challenge a provider's response to a particular type of service. Um, so why does it have to be delivered that way? Or why can't I go to the beach? Or why can't I... In, in Just ask you to slow down for you. the interpreters. Um, why can't I, um, as a participant, um, have a service the way that I would like? Um, when you are uh, an employee of the same organisation. Can I just pause you there? Is it the support coordinator's role to be asking those questions? It's the support coordinator's role to support the participant to ask those questions. Um, and in cases where a participant might be nonverbal, then yes, they would be um, asking that on their behalf. Um, it can also be um, supporting um, legal decision makers through that process as well. Right. And you do allow in your document for an exception. So can you explain where you see a, a basis for an exception to... Yes, there's a, a number of uh, exceptions we have um, to that particular standard. Um, and they're in circumstances where there's bespoke uh, service settings where a more integrated uh, service response might be appropriate. Some examples might be within particular Again, so yeah. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander settings. Um, uh, there could be some within the cold community um, where there may only be a single provider uh, available within that area to support a participant. Um, but in those circumstances, what our professional standards of practice seek to do is say, on top of um, or that exception, that doesn't mean that it's a carte blanche. You need to um, be able to demonstrate um, uh, a certain level of uh, management of that conflict throughout that process as opposed to um, um, uh, a more um, free-flowing ability um, to be able to influence participants' choices. From DIA's perspective, why is it not sufficient that um, if I'm a, a service provider and I've got a support coordinator and I offer a range of other services... And I explained to you, the participant, look, we do all these things and if you with our service, our support coordinator, you don't have to use the rest of our services. You just need to understand that we're all related. Why is that not enough? Um, so um, that's where we uh, put it at um, our um, independence of service provisions at uh, the participant level as opposed to an organisational level. Um, because for a... Um, a participant to be taken through um, from a choice and control perspective when looking at what their service offering um, portfolio might look like um, and the supports that they might engage, um, there is inherent bias um, and challenges with that conflict that will exist if you as the support coordinator are recommending or supporting a participant to engage with your own organisation. Um, there will, um, is likely to be a, a range of policy, and, and we've seen examples of this, policy and um, employment settings, which might preclude you as a support coordinator from questioning those particular uh, support arrangements. So without that uh, independence, it's very difficult for participants to be empowered to exercise their voice around the choices that they might want. Why hasn't uh, this already happened, do you think? That is a wonderful question. Um, there's been a number of reviews um, from the Tune Review to um, uh, JSC inquiries to, um, uh, yeah, I think about eight or nine over the last um, number of years that have all recommended um, increased um, conflict of interest provisions um, and um, um, service independence. 
Um, and that was what prompted uh, us as an organisation to take that line in the sand and put it into professional standards of practice um, ahead of um, more traditional regulatory um, structures. Are there uh, particular interest groups that are resisting uh, this change? Um, we've had um, discussions with a number of uh, organisations who deliver supports and services like this. Um, one of our requirements to being a member of DIA is to accept our professional standards of practice. Um, but in saying that, we have uh, a process that allows a provider to accept them on a transitional basis. So they might not be um, in alignment with that particular clause, but are able to demonstrate to DIA that um, they have an action plan in place um, that can be monitored to um, implement such um, independence of service at the participant level. Um, and we've successfully gone through 12 of those arrangements so far um, with um, providers who are, have recognised the challenges in trying to manage conflict of interest and um, have undertaken our um, uh, structure instead. Yes, thank you. What's the transition time on those 12? Um, they have been uh, varied, the shortest being um, 18 weeks, the longest being just over 12 months. We, we tend to find that... Um, during the transition period, um, most participants take uh, plan reassessment or plan review windows as a natural uh, juncture to be able to find alternative support arrangements. For some organisations, that has meant retaining the participant as a support coordination participant and having that support coordinator find alternative services for the other services they were delivering or vice versa. Coming back to what you were saying earlier about the, the capacity of support coordinators to assist and enable the participant to, to question and seek information or seek to, a service in a different way. Can you speak to uh, the, the crossover in role there and where the appropriate boundary is between support coordination and advocacy? It's a, uh, an ongoing discussion and topic area. Um, in um, our part of the sector, we talk about advocacy in the terms of little a advocacy or self-advocacy um, and supporting a participant to advocate on their own behalf. Where um, a participant might require more robust advocacy support, so that could be engaging through a, an AAT review, um, it could be going through um, um, other... Um, uh, processes or systems that um, require the um, in-depth service that an advocate would um, undertake, a support coordinator would be expected to assist the participant to engage that advocate. So when you said it's an ongoing conversation, is there, is there any resistance within the sector to support coordinators exercising that little a advocacy? Is it something that everybody accepts you do and should do or is there a contribution? Um, it's very much a funding based um, uh, discussion and consideration. So support coordination, unlike most um, other services in the NDIS, is not a fixed service. You don't buy support coordination as a to total package. Participants are funded based on a reasonable and necessary um, consideration. Um, and the number of hours and then the um, um, types of service or, or choices from the menu of support that a support coordinator um, might be able to deliver um, are, um, are variable. So for some participants with large support coordination funding, um, we'll have a multitude of um, service functions to deliver to a participant and, and support a participant with. Um, where others may only have, um, and we see unfortunately too many examples of 10 or 12 hours of support coordination funding, which then limits the level of um, capacity building and um, um, little lay advocacy work that they might be able to undertake. Does that 10 to 12 hours correlate with a, a particular level of support coordination? Not, not necessarily. Um, we tend to see that more at levels one and level two, less at level three, um, but it's not specific to an individual level. And that, that notion you were talking about then about the funding level impacting on the service that's provided um, steers us to another topic touched on in your statement, which is that of unfunded work. And in the 2022 Australian 
sorry, Disability Intermediary Australia sector report, which commissioners you have in your bundle, bundle A at tab 24, you say that, or the report says, 94% of support coordinators reported they supported participants beyond or outside the funding within their plan. Firstly, what are, that, what are those 94% of people doing? Are they doing support coordination but just beyond the funding or is it something additional to support coordination? Just beyond the funding. Is it this little a advocacy? Uh, not necessarily. Um, um, it, it can be a range of um, different reasons for providers to um, deliver that in an unfunded capacity. Everything from uh, moments of crisis that a participant might be going through. Um, it could be um, meeting um, regulatory obligations, so reporting to the Quality and Safeguards Commission or to state-based uh, regulatory structures. Um, it could be um, supporting a participant through change of circumstances or an unscheduled plan reassessment or review, um, practice supervision, um, particularly where there could be um, greater levels of complexity to a participant's support need that might not have been originally um, assessed or considered during a uh, planning process, um, and, and many others. Um, it is really very variable across the sector. Um, for the reasons why uh, a support coordinator would do that in an unfunded capacity. And it, so I understand from that it's a combination of face-to-face -face work and non-direct or non-face-to-face -face work. That's Some correct. of it's been described in other evidence this week as the admin that goes along with the, the direct contact. Uh, absolutely. Um, unlike some of the other uh, disability supports, when a participant is funded for support coordination, um, the NDIA will support a participant to connect with a support coordinator. That process is the request for service process. Um, and in that request for service process, um, the agency indicates uh, some reporting requirements that the support coordinator may have to report back to the um, agency, to the NDIA, on um, how the participant is um, um, implementing their plan. Typically, um, there's three reporting periods um, that a support coordinator will be required to do. Uh, one is a plan implementation report, which is typically eight weeks after the participant's connected with the support coordinator. Um, a mid-plan uh, report, um, which is variable based on the length of the plan. Um, and then a uh, plan review or plan reassessment report, which is typically due eight weeks before a participant um, will go through a plan reassessment. Um, and in those reports is a whole range of information as to how the participant has gone with their, um, with their plan um, and what considerations the agency might wish to take um, at the upcoming plan review. And the preparation of those reports is included in this 10 to 12 hours. Absolutely. Uh, moving on to the, the last collection of topics that I'd like to raise with you this afternoon, it's the topic of registration. Yes. You say in your statement that about half of the support coordinator members are registered with the NDIS. And you've given us some figures of how much it costs to go through that registration, an estimate of between $8,000 to $15,000. That's correct. What do your, men, your members see as the benefit or value of registration? Um, the value proposition for registration is um, incredibly uh, stressful at this particular juncture. Um, support coordination providers have had their um, pricing um, frozen for the last three years. Um, which makes it very difficult from an overheads perspective to be able to go through those registration costs and processes. But from a benefit perspective, um, our members who go through registration uh, report to us that it's um, there are particular areas in which um, uh, audit processes focus on. Um, and um, Laurie Lee gave some evidence earlier um, around um, some of those areas in particular um, um, uh, risk management frameworks and um, uh, employment relationship um, uh, structures as well as uh, a series of other reporting um, requirements that the Commission might have. And going through that audit process, those um, policies and procedures are stress tested, um, which um, provides some assurance to those providers that what they have um, in place is robust enough to be able to meet those audit requirements. Um, in saying that, um, the um, NDIS Commission regulates the market regardless of registration um, and a number of our members have previously been registered and chosen not to re-register 
um, or continue with their re registration um, for financial reasons um, in order to be able to remain uh, viable and to continue to deliver services. You have members in Victoria? That's correct. Are you aware of, uh, firstly, has Disability Intermediaries Australia given any guidance to your Victorian members on the Victorian scheme? Yes, we have. And are you aware of any providers who are actively encouraging their workers to register? Um, we're aware of a handful of providers um, that are um, actively encouraging their, um, their workers to register through that scheme. Um, at this stage, I believe it's about eight. Um, for particularly our plan management members, um, uh, that process is a little bit more difficult um, because of the way they operate nationally um, and that can um, create some um, duplication and, and difficulties. Um, but within the support coordination space, um, we are aware of a few providers that are interested in that. And so you said a handful and eight. How many members do you have in Victoria? What proportion is that? Um, from a, a percentage perspective, it would be less than 1%. And does Disability Intermediaries Australia have a view on the um, whether it would be appropriate or not to introduce a national registration scheme affecting support coordinators and plan managers? Um, well, plan managers are already required, so um, that would, um, in our view, um, continue to be appropriate. For support coordination, um, um, DIA takes the view that a um, national uh, mandatory worker screening process um, is the more appropriate way than what the current provider registration process is. Um, if the current provider registration process was to be reviewed, um, then we'd be able to make comments on, on whether that would be appropriate moving forward. Are you able to say briefly why the worker screening would be the appropriate process from your point of view? Um, uh, in not too dissimilar a context to disability support workers, support coordinators hold a um, long-standing and, and well-trusted relationship with the participants and the people with disability that they work with. Um, so having um, um, a worker screening process to review um, the workforce within um, that service provision um, is completely reasonable and, and um, um, I, none of our members have um, particular concerns about going through that. Echoing some of the comments made earlier, though, um, a national scheme rather than a state-by-state -state piecemeal approach um, is something that we would strongly encourage. Thank you very much, Mr Harper. Those are my questions. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll ask first Commissioner McEwen, do you have any questions? Uh, one question. One, maybe two questions. Uh, Mr Harper, thank you. Uh, you say that you've got 900, over, um, over 900 provider members. What percentage is that of all the support coordinating um, um, provided in Australia? Um, so there's currently somewhere in the vicinity of about 4,500 providers of support coordination. Um, however, when we look at the volumes of participants that they serve, um, we uh, approximate that it's about 70% of participants that have funding with support coordination are serviced by our members. And my final question related to, it kind of relates to what the Chair asked earlier about whether they've been registered. So why don't many other providers become members of your organisation? Do you know why? Um, we're rapidly and, and continuing to, to grow from a membership perspective. Um, when I started back in um, 2019, uh, we had uh, approximately 60 members and we're now at 900. So we're continuing to um, um, dive into the into the market and support um, the sector. Um, but there's a range of reasons why providers might seek not to, um, including um, not willing to accept our professional standards of practice. Um, so where those providers are conflicted, as we discussed earlier. Thank you. Commissioner Bell? No, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming to the Commission to give uh, evidence today. And thank you also for the uh, detailed statement that you've provided. Be grateful for your assistance. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, I tender the statement of Jess Harper dated the 6th of February 2023 and ask that it be given the marking of exhibit number 32 6 and together with its annexures, which you have in your bundle from tabs 22 to 29, I ask they be given the exhibit numbers 32 6. 6.1 to 32-6.8.
I think you mean 32-6.1 to 0.8. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. The, those documents will be admitted into evidence. The markings indicated by uh, Ms. Dowsett. Thank you. Uh, before we conclude, I'll just formalise the uh, discussions that I had with two of the council today. Uh, I make the following direction. Sunnyfield and Afford each file with the Office of Solicitor Assisting within seven days from today's date. Any written submissions, it wishes to provide in response to the propositions put by the Chair to its Council. Thank you. Is there anything else we need to do today? Uh, no, thank you, Chair. Adjourn until 10 a.m. tomorrow. 10 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you very much. The Royal Commission is now adjourned.